School Committee to order at 5.05 p.m. on September 28, 2021. And I would just wish a good afternoon and welcome to everyone, as well as to our viewers on WinCam. And we would like to acknowledge WinCam for always being there to support community access to our meetings. Uh, you can watch us via live streaming, or you can also watch us on Comcast channel 22, or Verizon channel 38. So, tonight's agenda includes, we will be starting with communications from the school committee and the administration. Uh, we will have a Down Syndrome Awareness Month um, input or communication. Um, we have field management committee recommendation regarding Charcha Field, um, the Middlesex letter to state legislators on, the on a vaccine mandate, and an office hours update. We also will have a student representatives report followed by public comment, and then reports and discussion items including lessons learned in pandemic learning from staff and student perspective, student service learning update, a nursing services update, assignment of a representative to the energy management committee, um, and then action items, including a consideration of approval of central office relocation, consideration of approval of fall town meeting warrant, consideration of approval of the Lotus Academy, and consideration of approval of a donation of, the dual, of a dual digital scoring table by the Winchester Sports Foundation, and consideration of approval of minutes from September 9th, 2021, and September 14th, 2021. Then we will have a chair report, and followed by a superintendent report, future agenda items, next meetings, the exec an ex and an executive session, <laughs> and adjournment. So with that, I would just say we have made an adjustment to our schedules going forward by providing a communication section at the beginning of our meetings for announcements from the school committee and from the administration. So I'll just note that this is simply conveying or pushing out information that we've received. It's not for discussion by the committee at this point. So if members have questions regarding any of the items, please let me know in preparation for upcoming meetings. So we will start with some community items. <coughs> um, so our school open houses have gone virtual this year and they are currently taking place. So please check your newsletters with your teachers for the dates and or with your, please check your newsletters or check in with your teachers for the dates and for the links. And I would also just like to make note of our save the date for a Lynch project kickoff, which will be the 16th of November. Um, and oh, I need my glasses. <laughs> Let me say a couple of words. You may, Mr. So, you may, so Mr. Two, Nixon. November 16th is a Tuesday. We are excited it is going to be an, an all-day kickoff to the new Lynch replacement project. Um, we are going to start the day at the auditorium and town hall in the morning. We believe around 9 o'clock. It's an opportunity for all citizens across town to um, come learn about the project team. We will be introducing the architect. We're not being coy. We don't have one yet. We're still in that process with the MSBA, but we will have it figured out by November 16th uh, to learn about the team, the schedule, and importantly, it's an opportunity for us to hear from Winchester citizens about what's important to them for the success of Lynch. And then during the day, that team will have an opportunity to uh, uh, have some work sessions with administration, town staff, we hope maybe some representatives of the Lynch PTO. And then for those who are really unable to attend a meeting in the morning, we're gonna do it all over again in the evening at Winchester High School in the auditorium. And we look forward to working with WinCam to certainly record it and possibly live stream it as well. So we're, that's an exciting date to get things started. Great, thank you very much for that. 
next, I would just like to acknowledge that October will be Down Syndrome Awareness Month. And I'd like to introduce a member of our community, Amy Moy, who is here with us tonight. She is a CPAC board member, and she's also a parent in the Ambrose School community. And she will be talking about this month and introducing it to us. And she will also read from her recently published book, The Polka Dotted Penguin. So I'll just hold that up for everybody to see. So, Ms. Moy. Can join us at the end of the table. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Amy Moy. I am a wife, mother, and optometrist in Winchester. And um, I realized having a, a child with Down syndrome, who is currently six years old at Ambrose, that I didn't have enough books to send into class for Down Syndrome Awareness Month. And so I decided to write my own. <laughs> Um, and I love penguins. So <laughs> this is a book about inclusion through the story of a baby penguin who's polka dotted. So, and just to say, um, I, I'm donating a book to each <laughs> elementary school for Down Syndrome Awareness Month um, as they come in. So. Um, so this is a polka dotted penguin. It was bedtime. I want a story about penguins, please, Mama, said Evie. I like penguins too, said Mama, and I have just the story. Evie snuggled next to Mama. Once in the cold land of emperor penguins, the daddy penguins stood together on the ice. Each daddy penguin was nestling an egg between his feet and belly to keep it warm. But one egg was different than the rest. This egg isn't like the other eggs. It has polka dots, said one penguin. So what if my egg has polka dots, said the egg's daddy. It's not like the other eggs, another penguin said. Something is very unusual. We will see, said daddy penguin. He nudged his polka dotted egg closer to his fur. One day, all the eggs started to hatch. Peck, peck, knock, knock. Scritch, scratch, meep. Out, peck, popped a beak. Peck, peck, knock, knock. Scritch, scratch, meep. Out, poked a flipper. The baby penguin broke free and la looked at her daddy. Daddy penguin lovingly kissed her fuzzy gray head. She looked like the other baby penguins. She had a fuzzy head, two eyes, a beak, two flippers, a belly, and a tail like the others. But her head had polka dots sprinkled all over and she was smaller than the other babies. The other daddy penguins came to meet her. Well, she doesn't look that different, said one. I thought she'd have more polka dots, said another. All the mama penguins returned to the iceberg to meet and name their babies. Mama and daddy penguin decided to name their baby penguin Dottie. Since Dottie had polka dots on her fur, her parents never had trouble finding her in a crowd. Dottie the penguin waddled around with the other baby penguins. She wasn't as fast as they were, but she happily followed them around the ice. I'm coming too, Dottie squealed. At Penguin School, Dottie loved music class the most. Her short beak couldn't form the words to the songs very well, but she still sang with all of her heart. Her favorite song was the Itsy Bitsy Prawn. She danced along with everyone else when the penguins sang Head and Flippers, Tail and Toes. At home, she danced to the tunes of her favorite singer, Corey Beekner. In gym class, they played catch the fish, and each penguin took turns being the fish. Dottie didn't catch the fish very often, but she laughed with glee as she swam with her friends. One, two, three, four, five fish, she would shout. At story time, Dottie loved reading We're Going on a Fish Hunt and The Very Hungry Whale. She knew all the words by heart. At Dottie's birthday party, Mama Penguin and Daddy Penguin fondly watched Dottie slide down the icy hill with her friends. They knew their baby penguin was more alike the others than different, although sometimes it took time for the penguins to realize it. They taught new penguin friends to simply say hi if they did not know what to say to Dottie. Dottie loved to give a high five flipper too. 
The older penguins watched Dottie carefully at first, not sure how to treat her. Some of the other baby penguins teased her. They asked their parents why Dottie looked different or why she had trouble speaking. But her friends simply saw her as Dottie. When she went down the slide, they cheered, Dottie, Dottie. Dottie would say, more slide, please. Soon, the older penguins realized they could treat Dottie like any other penguin. She just might need an extra flipper to help her along. Everyone needs an extra flipper sometimes. The end, said Mama, closing the book. I liked that story, said Evie, yawning. I would be friends with Dottie. Mama said fondly, I know you would, Evie. You are a kind friend. Being kind is the best way to learn what makes each person different and special. And now, good night, my polka-dotted princess. I love you. And Evie snuggled into her pillow and dreamed of swimming with the penguins. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you to Karen and Michelle for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. And very nice to meet you all. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Congratulations. Yes, yeah, so a huge accomplishment. <laughs> OK. Um, so next, we have a field management committee update. And here we have an adjustment to the agenda. Uh, this is a communication we had received from the field management committee, but we still have many questions that have to go back to the field management committee. So we will move on from this. Um, and next, we have a Middlesex League letter to state legislators on a vaccine mandate. And I've included a link in a to a letter in your packet from other school committees that is going to state legislator legislators seeking signatories regarding vaccine requirements. This is just FYI for your information for the moment. So please let me know if you have any questions or comments on this before the next meeting. And next, we will have an office hours update from Mr. Hopcroft and Ms. Bergstrom. Great. Um, so uh, the, our, our new superintendent is uh, already doing a great job um, uh, you know, improving the communications and the access um, for our parent community to interact with the, the, uh, the district. And so we're, we are um, looking at you know, whether uh, reinstating the office hours program um, would would be beneficial for that. I, I understand um, that this will be on our agenda to discuss at uh, our norms meeting tomorrow. But um, you know, we want to you know, do what we can to you know, create opportunities for um, meaningful interaction between our community and and uh, uh, and the district. Any additional thoughts on that, Michelle? No. Um, I don't. None of the meetings, the office hours, have been scheduled yet for this year. So. Um, if we choose to move forward with that just um, for community information that would be we would publish those publicly before um, we would obviously hold those so just so everybody knows they haven't missed anything and it's just not out there yet the committee is still in the process of deciding how to move forward with those okay. thank you Okay, thank you very much. And then, um, Dr. Hackett, do you have any announcements that you have? I would just like to uh, <coughs> introduce uh, uh, Andrew Marin. Andrew is uh, to your right, to my right, I should say. Uh, t yesterday was Andrew's first day. He is the in the position of the operations and planning manager. Um, some of what we're doing tonight, just a few adjustments for this meeting has been, uh, Andrew's already been helpful with um, in terms of the technology and just to make the statement that I've got a lot going on here. So if I mess this up, it is on me, but um, we're excited to have Andrew. We've uh, already, uh, Mr. Rowe and Andrew and I met today. I uh, met also with uh, uh, Aaron Allen to talk about just communication and organizing the school committee packet and the posting process and all the rest of it so we are um, we're we are, I am thrilled to have Andrew with us and uh, he will be will be rolling him out over the next couple of weeks uh, meeting with the various department uh, town department people in fact we actually met with Pete Lawson today um, texted him and he came up had a chance to, to speak with him a little bit and then we're going to meet with 
more of his department next week, um, Mr. Rowe and, and Andrew and myself. So we are, um, there's plenty to do and he, uh, he's, he'll certainly uh, pick up on it quickly. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Good to have you. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. So you're going to stick until I get the next step of this done and then if you, you know, you don't need to stay for the whole meeting, so. <laughs> I also would like to, if I could, just touch on a couple of things. Um, we've, uh, as you know, the uh, MCAS results for 2021 were released last week. Um, they were embargoed through last Tuesday. Uh, they were um, released later in the day on Tuesday. They are up on the Department of Education's website. I know that um, we were uh, named uh, among, as, as being among um, affluent communities, apparently, by the Boston Globe and um, just not to go into a, a full report on it I you know we, what we want to do and what we are already doing is is trying to really look at the data analyze the data and try to figure out what it means for us currently um, not going to go into a lot of um, detail around just concerns about the actual testing and the testing environment um, I think that you know what we really want to do is is use that use the results of the test as, as a as an opportunity for us to see if we can determine with some individual kids or uh, to provide some additional supports. Um, but at this point right now, we really are just trying to make sense of the data as it's been, uh, as it's been posted. I know that um, it was not surprising. I think that uh, most of the school systems in, in the Commonwealth did not perform as well as they did in 2019. Um, I do think there's some questions around what was tested. I will point out, uh, interestingly, that um, uh, uh, the state average of uh, high schools uh, actually went up from 2019. So um, it was really kind of an interesting contrast between the high school and what they're terming, uh, termed as grades three through eight. Just one observation that lumping grades through eight, three through eight, we definitely had a couple of grade levels that were did not perform as well or the performance looked like an anomaly compared to the others, which then factors into the averaging of grades three through eight. So we're very curious about that part of it. As you know, uh, you know we're not a huge school system. So when you look at, for example, a grade five or well, grade five, six math, for example, or anything, any math at the high school, there are only certain teachers that are teaching that. And we all also experienced the fact that we had some teachers out on leave last year for COVID related leaves uh, or other related leaves. So we're just trying to make sense of those anomalies first. Um, and in kind of coming in behind that, as, uh, as you know, we, we have received uh, ESSER funding, ESSER 1, 2, and 3 funding. ESSER 1, we will be uh, dedicating primarily uh, to additional cleaning services. We have uh, entered into, well, the town has uh, through uh, uh, Pete Lawson and Department of Buildings entered into a contracted service, same arrangement we had last year essentially it's a four additional hours each building for disinfecting related to COVID and COVID cleaning. Part of what we thought we were going to be doing this year uh, as we went, as we got into July, we did not think we we're going to be dealing with a variant. We didn't think we we're going to be masking. We didn't think we we're going to be buying PPE. We didn't think we were going to be having to really respond to COVID uh, in the way that we've had to. So we really have had to shift gears with how we think, how we're thinking about ESSER funding and how we're using it. Um, we have prioritized cleaning. We have prioritized uh, doing the best we can to distance, especially when students have their masks off. So we have purchased additional desks, for example, to create that distancing. We're using spaces that are go beyond just the cafeteria to try to create some distancing. It's obviously more difficult when all students are back in person. Um, and we'll hear a little bit tonight about just the testing program and some uh, data from, from our nursing department. Um, but we have had to adjust how we are thinking about using ESSER funds that was not really going to be the intended purpose, for example, of ESSER 1. So um, ESSER 2 we have, uh, was already submitted uh, prior to my arrival. Those funds are really dedicated to student supports. Um, and we have not yet planned out how we're going to use those funds. I think what we need to do Professionally, I think we need to, to see where our kids are at, identify what the needs are, and I think we need to stay flexible. I think if anything we learned last year out of the experience we had was that flexibility is key. And um, so we are gonna focus on uh, being able to make decisions, provide supports in a way that's responsive to the needs of our students and our teachers. 
as we go into Esther 3, um, as we talked about at one of the me meetings here not too long ago, one project that we are going to include in Esther 3, because Esther 3 does allow for capital projects, is to pick up a year one cost or a portion of whatever it is that $130,000 provides for the McCall ventilation project, HVAC project, which is not to go into detail, you've already heard about it, but fortunately uh, that project can be done in kind of a, a, a phased in way. Uh, it involves a replacement of um, the units that are in the classrooms now, uh, which are pneumatic units, so there's no real control over how much airflow there's no digital control of how much airflow we can bring into the classroom spaces. Um, this was already piloted, and these units are, can be part of, our, uh, of the energy management control system that, 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 um, through the town. So we will be able to control the airflow. Right now, truly, it's a manual adjustment that's made by, um, by the facilities department. So that will be one chunk of SR3. Um, we will also be including some support for um, students as well. There's a 20% set aside uh, for instructional loss, um, which is what we're terming it anyway. Uh, so we will not only have that amount, but some additional amount out of that um, grant set aside for that as well. So again, we're looking for flexibility. Uh, we will be looking for input from teachers, obviously, as we go through and do our own local assessments over the courses of this fall and gather data to see um, where our students are at and, and um, um, then being able to make those adjustments. So um, if anyone has any questions around any of them, I'm certainly happy to answer it now, but just wanted to really communicate the ESSER grants, as you know or not, there's no school committee requirement for, uh, for approval. Uh, they're submitted administratively, um, and we can get you some more details as we go through the end of, uh, get through the end of the week. So, all right. And... That is it for me. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, we will have our student representatives report. So I would like to welcome to the table our student representatives from the Winchester High School School Council, Ms. L. O'Connor and Mr. Charlie Savage. Thank you for joining us this evening. No problem. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you all very much for inviting us here again. We hope this report can provide some helpful insight. So last week, many clubs had their first meetings and sports teams continued with their fall season, having games throughout the week. It was very exciting to see all of the students supporting their peers in a larger social setting than they had been before. Two weeks ago, the student council had its first meeting with the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We introduced new members to the council and continue to grow our committees from last year, which included the Athletic Photos Committee, the Mental Health Committee, the Website Committee, and the Merchandise Committee. Last week, the officers met with the newly elected ninth graders to inform them about what goes on in the council. They will be attending their first student council meeting tomorrow night. Student council also hosted some of their first fundraising efforts of the year last week. Many students were very excited by the return of the Student Council Cookie Walk. We had a huge cookie walk and managed to sell out of all of our baked goods. Teachers and parents also met last week over Zoom for back to school night. The WHS athletes partnered with Anka Pantry and had a can drive at the beginning of last week's Friday Night Lights. It was such a success that we plan on hosting a spirit soup drive at our spirit fair in November. All right, I'll segue one off of what Elle said. Um, the upperclassmen recently finished their first level of the ninth grade mentorship program through uh, Miss Paradise, which has seemed to be a huge success for this first year. And many of my friends participating in it say uh, that they're thinking that they are connecting more with the ninth graders and that the ninth graders are learning more about the school uh, and about the upperclassmen. Uh, with the addition of the class-wide ninth grade Google Classroom, uh, they have more resources and they feel more connected to the school. We also held Spirit Night last Friday, which was really great for teams and clubs. We saw a huge turnout and the time with the football game worked great. Luckily, a student council was able to sell most of our leftover sweatshirts, uh, which will give us extra funds to hold bigger fundraisers later in the year and will allow us to buy new sweatshirts for Spirit Fair. Um, as, many of you, uh, as many of you know, uh, the annual Wiffy Town Race, along with uh, the Glen Doherty Race, were held on Sunday. And we saw a lot of participation by WHS athletes, both in the race and through volunteering. 
I found it really nice as it gave a sense of normalcy without breaking the COVID guidelines. Uh, now getting into the more educational topics, uh, WHS will be hosting the SAT this Saturday, October 3rd, along with the 11th grade PSAT on October 16th. Finally, Elle and I have begun the preparations for Spirit Fair, and we're currently working on setting out a blurb in the morning announcements to get club and team attention. Uh, we're planning to have this out by the end of the week. Now onto our big topic for tonight, uh, which was lessons learned during the pandemic. We recently sent out a form to the student council asking them a series of questions about COVID schooling last year, and we'd like to share some of the results with you so you can get a student perspective. Our first question is to ask students how they would rate their overall experience last year on a scale of one to 10. The average answer here was a five. When asked how they would believe their teachers handled online learning, learning uh, the average number here was a 6.3. We then proceed to ask more detailed questions, such as strategies students found effective. Many students found learning more effective and enjoyable when working in groups, keeping themselves organized, taking times to play games or go outside or in order to take breaks from their computers, and they preferred project-based assessments over quizzes and tests. When asked about changes they would have made to the school year, many answered spending more time outside or even having outdoor classrooms, having less lectures online, having more teachers assigned PBAs instead of tests and quizzes, and for remote students, having less gaps between the classes. The survey also revealed that students felt their transition back to school has been very smooth with the help of administration and the teachers and all the resources that they have been provided with. Everyone is very happy to see their friends and get back into their normal, regular routines. Some students also mentioned that they feel like the workload has definitely increased since last year. Some overall lessons that students learned from the pandemic are how to time manage, how to get organized, how to be independent, and they gained an idea of what their college schedules might look like. Some students also mentioned that they have come to appreciate the ability to school and that, quote, school is a gift. Most students agreed that the pandemic has had a negative effect on their learning abilities. Some feel like they are behind, that it is difficult to get old study habits back, and that their attention span has decreased. But many students are excited and hopeful to see what this fully in-person school year has in store for them. Again, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, please feel free to ask any new questions or any questions regarding topics we discussed last week. So I, I yes, have a question, I have a procedural one I want to throw yes. to the chair first. So we have this on the agenda under item 5A. Will yes. our two representatives be joining us for that or this is our window, because I'm sure you have stuff you need to be doing at home, um, to, to engage in some questions on this? So this is a window for the students right now. Yeah. So, and we will address uh, the lessons learned um, later. But they will be with later. us, they'll they be will with us for that we think? They will not be with they us. They will not be with us on that part. So this right. would be so the this opportunity is your to address own. questions to them. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Therefore, uh, <laughs> continuing thank on. Thank you for the detailed report. Um, can you share with us when did the survey go out? We I think it was approximately two weeks ago, maybe okay. three. Yeah, I believe the survey was due. Um, I'd like to say last weekend, but it was sent out Wednesday. Uh, two weeks ago. Okay, and can you share with us, um, so were you surveying um, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders who, who were sort of here at the high school last year, or were you serving ninth grade, surveying ninth graders who, of course, are they have experiences at McCall? Um, we included 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, and they were, we just opened it up to the student council members and but we would love to do like a new survey and opened it up to the school if that would be helpful too okay so that was actually where i was going next i was just curious what your end was how, how many respondents did you actually have to these these questions i think it was about 20. i think it was 24 to be exact okay uh, we're um, planning to send out a larger survey so we can get a more detailed response however obviously the more detailed questions are a lot harder to categorize when you have a lot more responses sure well, you know, even if a lot of people can't take a time, a lot of time for open responses, um, you know, where you're asking for, uh, students to rank their experience on a scale of one to ten, when you get a really big end number, that can still be really interesting as well. So, 
I'd, I'd love to know kind of what the bigger group thinks. Um, I think your, the questions you asked were great. Um, and Mr. Hopcroft was in the way, so I couldn't tell if Dr. Ellen Emma was smiling when we hear students express their love for PBAs. And <laughs> you, know, so. you knew it already. I knew you it already. You didn't have to see it to know. Uh, I was, I was I could just see very, the eyes. <laughs> I'll do I, I'm very happy to hear that. I'm happy to know high school students know what that alphabet soup means, because it, it, it means a lot to us, and it does really reflect a pivot um, in our approach. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Hopcroft. Yeah. Uh, I, first of all, um, this is wonderful. Uh, I'm really glad that you're doing this. And, um, and, uh, and I think that the smaller end size um, of the student council um, survey you know, may give you ideas that you can use to create a more quantifiable when you go to the larger uh, group, because I, I do get the problem that you state about, um, uh, about managing a large number of open-ended responses. Um, I was curious. You you had mentioned um, you know I, I love like the idea of more outdoor classrooms when when possible and things like that. Um, you had mentioned less online, and and I was curious if if in your results or or perhaps in your future survey, there might be a way to um, explore if there had been uses of either technology or practices that um, were new um, because of the pandemic that might be beneficial. You know, are, are there examples of something that you're now able to do now that you know, everyone's online? Um, and so maybe you ha I'd be curious if you saw anything like that in the survey results or, or if you might consider exploring, you know, um, you know I, I really think of the, you know, making lemonade out of lemons or the silver linings or however you want to put it, you know, you know what, are the, what are the things, we've gone through a tough year, what are the, the, the things that were really surprising and great that we want to make sure we keep? I think we did have a few answers, but most of those were asked uh, about strategies they found effective. Um, a lot of this was like in class games, especially on those Wednesdays. Uh, those involve like things like GimKit, uh, Kahoot, Edpuzzle, um, Blookit. There's a lot of those websites that sort of almost popped out of nowhere during the pandemic that uh, students found really engaging. Obviously, they have a more uh, playful like undertone to them, but I think, at least in my experience, they've been very engaging. I've been able to learn a lot. It's great for things where you really just, or subjects where you really just have like a list of terms you have to learn, like uh, history or maybe language. Um, but I think a lot of students mentioned that those sorts of games were very effective. And if I could just jump in for a second, um, when we talk about our presentation um, later, a lot of the teachers that sent data from that had gathered that from the students, what they're finding helpful carrying on. So you'll see more of that there too. If I could say one, one other thing, um, you know, it may be interesting to even just ask people what new, you know, games, technologies, programs, you know, have you used in this last year? Um, because even just creating a list, you know, that, that's a case where open-ended data uh, could really be interesting. But thank, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I just want to thank you guys for taking this on. It was a pretty open-ended assignment that we um, gave you to go back and sort of find out what lessons students learned from the pandemic. And um, writing surveys and designing surveys is hard uh, even for adults who've been doing it for many years. So taking that on in your capacity is just, it was a, it's an amazing thing. So um, I hope that if there's interest among student council to continue moving that forward that um, you're able to walk, work with Dr. Ellen Emma or um, some mentors at the high school who might want to help you build those surveys out and um, continue to collect good information that can really be useful to you and your teachers and us here at the committee. So thank you. Thank you. I just also want to thank you guys for your work on that food drive. That's really exciting that you were able to do that and then decide right away that you're already going to have another one around uh, in November. So that really appreciated helping the community and you know making that large effort and then right away stepping up and saying, wow, this went really well. Let's do this again and let's do it again soon. So kudos to you on that. Uh, I just like your enthusiasm. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, make a pandemic sound awesome. <laughs> 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 It's because they're young and they can charge <laughs> ahead and deal with that. that. <laughs> so, um, and I just wanted to say that I had gone to the PFA meeting last night and I really enjoyed the presentation from Mr. Mahoney and from the new Dean of Student Life, Ms. Paradise. 
Um, they had some good information for the parents there just on back to school and how the experience has been. And they also talked about the mentoring, mentoring program that you had brought up last time and that you talked about in some more detail today. And I think it's really impressive to hear how much the 11th and 12th graders have reached out to the incoming ninth graders and how you've supported them um, with mentoring and uh, playing a leading role at some of the events that were set up to help the incoming ninth graders and then also helping with tutoring. Um, so I think it's a real testament to how involved our students are and I just wanted to say a big thank you to you and also to your classmates. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any more from us? So we appreciate your time as always and if you, if you would like to stay and listen in for a bit, you are welcome to do so, but if you are busy this evening, then um, that's fine if you need to move on to the rest of your schedules too. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us this evening. Okay, so now we will move on to the public comment portion of our meeting and I will read our verbiage that public comment shall be for a period of 20 minutes and it's not a discussion, a debate or a dialogue between individuals and the committee. It's a citizen's opportunity to express their opinion on issues on the agenda or of school committee business. Any individual wishing to speak before the committee shall identify themselves by name and address and speak for no more than three minutes. And all individuals shall speak to the full committee through the chair and shall not address individual members or the administrators. And as we mentioned at our last meeting, we have some new procedures for public comment. We offer in-person public comment uh, at which we request you to please sign in on the clipboard outside the room with the requested information. And we also offer remote public comment with registration 24 hours in advance. Um, and for our remote participants, if we have any, we ask that you please turn on your cameras and give your names and addresses consistent with our in-person process. Um, so we will begin with our um, in-person public comment and I will welcome to the table Miss Megan Blackwell. Hello, thank you. I'm Megan Blackwell. My address is 3 Stafford Road in Precinct 7. I'm also a member and chair of the Finance Committee. And uh, tonight, uh, my public comment is in the context of one of your uh, agenda items, the vote on the move of the central office. So a number of finance members attended or uh, finance committee members attended or watched the uh, top A presentation, which was very helpful. Thank you for arranging that. And um, there were questions remaining about all viable options. So I think the move to the carriage house was nicely presented and clear. It would be around $6 million. The potential move to Lynch was less well clear it seemed to be about 4.2 million plus a little more. Um, and then a third option, other options weren't mentioned, like the possibility of staying at Parkhurst. Um, what, and of course, right sizing it. But um, one question is how much would that cost? If it's viable, if it's not viable, why not? And I, I think previously when uh, the move to the carriage house was first considered, there was a nice analysis of alternatives of renting office space. So it would be helpful, I think, when this is presented to the town or to, to finance committee, just to do that analysis of alternatives um, to best inform the financial implications and um, the impact to the town. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Blackwell. Ms. 
Blackwell, can I just ask you real quickly before you go, were you here on your own capacity or speaking on behalf of the Finance Committee? Oh, so um, when we last had our Finance Committee meeting, um, I offered to take any questions okay. to the school committee. Great. So thank it's you. in the latter. Just checking. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other person signed up there for in person? There's nobody else out in the hall okay. except for people doing presentations. For presentations. Later. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we will move to our remote public comment, and we have one um, community member who will be sp who will be speaking at public comment remotely tonight. Um, so I will ask Dr. Hackett to please elevate Miss Susan Delea. We can hear you. Hello, sorry, I'm toggling back and forth between listening on the webinar and coming on this. So I'm sorry because I think the webinar is a little delayed. Can you see me? We no. cannot see you. You don't have your video on. Okay, so I just came Thank back you. to the Zoom while I was here. Is it coming in now? Um, okay, well, I don't want to take up too much time here. I think many of you know what I look like, but if you want me to spend the time to look, it's just... Yes. Okay. Could we, we will be happy to wait for that for a minute. Okay. I'm not being given an option on this webinar to show my video. That is uh, my fault, so sorry about that. You should have the option now. Yay. Thank you. You are muted. I'm mute. Now we're here. Okay. Sorry, I was worried it was my fault, but thank you. Uh, so thank my you. name is Susan DeLeo, 24 Tap Drive. Um, this evening, I urge the school committee to vote no on the $6 million project for the carriage house. Um, I think I echo the concerns of Ms. Blackwell, who just spoke. Where is the funding for this project coming from? An override, a debt exclusion? Are these the possibilities? Um, what are the alternatives to the space for the administration? Winchester has a plethora of office space available now due to the pandemic, so maybe we could look into that. Um, Parkhurst, uh, last night, um, after select person Rich Mucci questioned um, Mr. Nixon, uh, we found out that Parkhurst will sit empty after it is being used for swing space for the school renovation. So, you know, have we fully flushed out why Parkhurst can't be used in the future for the central office? Um, just right now, given the current climate, the pandemic world we're all living in, it seems like this is a irresponsible use of taxpayer money. Um, we are losing teachers that the school desperately needs to school districts who pay their teachers more. Um, for many of us, $6 million in a cash strapped uh, school district like this is a lot of money. And if we're contemplating spending this kind of cash, what are the other um, places that this money could be better used? Um, preference for most of us, especially after the effects of this pandemic, would be that it's put towards teachers and students. Um, as you all know, the Boston Globe noted that Winchester is one of the school districts that was down 20%. Now I know, Dr. Hackett, you just spoke about how um, a lot of the lower grades you may consider anomalies uh, for these scores. These are children, they're not anomalies, they've all been extremely resilient and they've worked incredibly hard in a terrible situation. Um, your average second grader has never had a normal year of school yet. Uh, we need to 
spend a little bit more time thinking about the relocation or the, the housing of central office personnel, especially in a climate where we have learning loss related to the pandemic. And last night I saw beautiful slides, beautiful images of a beautiful building, which in an ideal world would be terrific, but I have yet to see any slides regarding the learning loss in our students over the course of these past, you know, now this is the third academic year that we're entering. Um, we also have in this town two uh, outstanding DESE PRS complaints regarding the literacy curriculum. Where will the funding come for that? Um, we have to think of all options when it comes to housing the administration. Another option could be why can't the administration work remotely? It was good enough for the kids to do. Why don't we give that a whirl? Um, we need to help our teachers. They have worked so incredibly hard during this pandemic to give our children everything that they can. And we need to make sure that we retain these awesome teachers. Ambrose lost where my children go to school, lost some really great teachers this year. Um, and that, you know, that was a huge blow to the school. So as a society, we have a sacred promise to our children and to our neighbor's children to educate them. And we need to make good on that promise before we start spending money on office space. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, seeing that we have no further um, persons who would like to make a public comment, I will now close public comment at 5.51. Um, and we will move on to our reports and discussion items. I think I detect an echo. Yeah, I think, I think that line might be on. So again, new setup tonight. We're constantly tweaking the process. We are. But We're working the problem. myself in two-part <laughs> harmony was not good. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> but, okay, thank you very much. So now we will move into the reports and discussion items. Um, let me just see. And first on our agenda was, or is, lessons learned in pandemic learning from the staff and students' perspective. And I guess we have a change, or we have a- An audible. A change in plan? A, cha a, <coughs> a change, perhaps, of agenda, so, which I will turn to Dr. Hackett. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, is, it was great to hear from the students tonight and have an opportunity to ask them some information. Uh, I know Dr. Ellen Emma is gonna be working with them to help uh, kind of guide them through the next step of data collection. Um, and we obviously also have some questions. I think it'd be a great opportunity for us to ask. I, I also think it's a great opportunity for the school committee to ask. As part of that, uh, as you know, you have a norm setting workshop and a goal setting workshop tomorrow. Our suggestion on this presentation, which is really kind of pulling back in a little bit of a bigger picture uh, that Dr. Alman, Alan Emma put together uh, with staff imp input as well. It, we believe that it would fit very well into goal setting tomorrow so that we can have the conversations about where we wanna go, what we've learned, um, what we heard from students, but also kind of what we learned as a school system um, and how we can maintain that and not slide back into uh, old routines because that is the natural tendency of kind of regression to the mean, uh, which we do not want to do. So our recommendation is to have this not be a presentation so much as it be a working document for uh, for your goal setting tomorrow night. And um, at, we can decide at a later point whether we want to bring the full presentation back or kind of have it as a report out as part of the goal setting process. Thank you. Uh, seeing as this would be a change to our agenda, um, I think we could reach consensus uh, that we would like to do so. Yeah. And seeing that we appear to have consensus, then we will move this item into our goal setting session for tomorrow. 
Um, let me just see. So next up, we have um, one more change of agenda item. Um, I would like to move the nursing services update up in front of our student services update. Um, and could we have consensus on doing that as well? Thank you very much. So now I would just like to welcome to the table uh, Ms. Jennifer Markham, who is our head nurse in the district. And she will provi be providing an update on nursing services and the K through 12 COVID-19 testing program. Winchester is one of the first districts in the state to roll out the test and stay component. And as part of this, we have a website that's dedicated uh, to information and registration and case tracking within the schools. So welcome, Ms. Markham. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, we have lots of updates on our um, just COVID information and also our testing program. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just to start, we just want to thank everyone for their patience as um, guidelines are continuing to change from DPH and DESE, particularly on um, close contacts, how we're contact tracing, as well as quarantining. So thank you for your patience and, you know, we're, we're trying to stay um, as up to date as possible on that. Um, in terms of a quick snapshot on how Winchester is doing, um, since September 1st, we've had 60 residents of Winchester with a confirmed um, PCR test. And um, since September 1st, we have had 17 cases of um, students or staff that have had a either a positive PCR or a confirmed um, antigen test. Currently, we only have one active case. So overall, I feel like we're doing pretty well. Um, our positivity rate right now is 1.10, and that's for the town. Um, and on the Winchester Health Department, um, they keep an updated um, dashboard, and they also keep updated graphs. So you can actually go on and see how we're doing compared to other communities. So that's um, good information. Um, we started our test and stay program on, let's see, September 15th. And um, we have tested 39 students um, who have been identified as close contacts to a positive person during the school day um, that have been unvaccinated. So, um, so far we've had no positive test results, so that was fabulous news. Um, we have tested in five schools, Ambrose, Lincoln, McCall, VO, and, and the high school. Um, and this has resulted in um, 81 school days that otherwise the children would have missed school. So that was, that was our goal, so we're very happy about that. Um, does anyone have any questions on test and stay? Okay. Uh, Mr. Hopcroft? Um, I, I, I think it says it in, in here on the form, but um, you, you noted the five schools that, you know, um, Lynch and Morocco not being part of them. It looks like they're phasing in, in, in throughout October, but could you just address? Uh, yes, absolutely. That? So test and stay is if we've had a positive case in a school building, we implement test and stay versus the pool testing or the COVID safety um, oh. testing. So test and stay has been res has resulted in a positive case. So we've gone in and contact traced, found out the students um, that are considered close contacts, and um, we have enrolled them in the test. You know, if the parents um, enroll the child, we've tested them in school versus the, um, the pool testing, which is the COVID safety checks. Okay, so, so the difference is that you haven't had the cases to need to do it so yet. we may have had it before that September 15th yeah. um, September 15th but th our rollout started September right. 15th so after September 15th the first um, test and stay started the high school and then we moved to um, VO I believe so right right now we've not so ha we've not had the opportunity to do test and stay at Morocco or Lynch and, and that's a good news story because it, means it we is haven't, right we haven't so needed it but the, the surveillance testing is happening at all the schools. And the test and say will happen if there are kids that need it. Right. So we decided to, because um, the, this testing in the buildings, you know, it's fairly new to us, we decided to focus on test and stay because we knew the impact would be greater there if we started with that initiative first, mm -hmm. meaning that children or teachers even that are close contacts, um, if they're asymptomatic, so no symptoms, not vaccinated, uh, we could, in, you know, hopefully enroll them in the program and get them tested 
at school and then that would um, allow them to stay in school versus missing school so it's just two separate programs and we decided to put most of our you know our focus right here on test and stay first yeah, that, that makes sense because that's where the sick people are <laughs> that's, yeah. 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 Thank um, you. so now we are moving into um, you know now we're moving into introducing the um, this COVID safety checks which is the pool testing um, so we have consent on our website for families that are, want to opt in for the testing programs and it's on uh, the Winchester um, PS it's WPS COVID testing and we do have some information on consents so since September 22nd uh, we do have data on by school how many families have opted in for the testing and you can see that on the sheet there um, the enrollment again is on the website but it's also been communicated through the the building principals um, we it, the state did provide a um, consent form so when families sign in they're actually signing in for um, all the testing available however we're we're focusing on test and say and the COVID safety checks we did develop an opt-out um, process so on the website you can go into your schools your child's school and on a pull down screen find your child's school and do an opt-out so um, you know you can actually you know conceivably you know just enroll your child in test and say versus pool testing and we'll be really uh, you know we're, we're printing out those lists of opt-outs so we will not be testing children that have been opt out opted out for one program or the other um, but overall the um, participation rate for you know the entire district right this is almost a week old but it's 32 percent so I'm sure you know if we look at the data we'll have more enrollment um, we also are going to have printed paper consents at the different schools uh, available in different languages for um, for just easy access for everybody if someone um, isn't it did not sign online so the next piece of Jen, the, before yes. you go on, I, I'm sorry could I just make one point I, I think and um, this is a question actually would you is it fair to say that the 17 percent registration rate at the high school is is related to the fact that at every grade level we have o over 80 percent of our students vaccinated because they would not be in test and stay if they're vaccinated is that correct right so test and stay is for unvaccinated so that's correct okay. um the so the state initially you know really wanted to kind of focus on those unvaccinated folks however vaccinated students and staff can be part of um the pool testing the COVID safety checks but um but it is low it is lower than the other schools but not part of test and stay right right so the 17 percent only reflects pooled testing right. consent I mean we do have a low percentage of high school students that are not vaccinated right so yeah you know probably less than 20 percent so the number does correlate I would say yeah. I was just trying so, to figure out if this consent percentage at the bottom that are in yellow right. are for test and stay pool so you testing have to, or both. Right, that's the so the way the state set up the um, consent form, you have to that consent to all. Right. Mm -hmm. So that would be both. And then right. locally we've worked out a process for opting right. out of one or the other. So that would be the number the percentage of students who have actually registered for the testing program in total. Okay. So next week we're going to start our rollout of our weekly safety checks formerly called the pool testing um, and we are doing in a staged approach uh, we're going to try to you know we're going to start small you know have some success and then build on our success um, we also are doing that just because of limitations with CIC that's the um, that is the company that you know Desi has hired to implement all this testing and there are some staffing challenges so we are um, just based on information on what we have available for staffing for next week we're going to start at Morocco next Monday and test um, you know for children that are, are signed up for the program test grade three to five and then um, we're going to start the um, Next week, also start with McCall, just giving out the VAR test, um, the containers for the saliva tests. And then we'll kind of build on that, as you can see. Um, so communication, I feel like, has been pretty good. We have the, uh, the website's been updated. We have the COVID website. We have the testing website. Um, we have our dashboard that we are updating. You know, just about twice a week, we're updating the cases, the case numbers. Um, 
we have the frequently asked questions um, line that you know parents can submit questions and you know the response rate is pretty quick we've had about 41 <laughs> parents ask questions and then you know we've responded to um, and then I do want to mention that next Wednesday October 6 we're going to have a um, a panel discussion with Jen Murphy Jess Pfefferman and myself um, just to kind of help answer more questions that parents may have is that online or that we're gonna have a webinar so webinar. We, yeah webinar. so we'll set out information on that in the next couple of days so can I ask you another question yes mr. Hopcroft uh, first I'll say uh, that the statistics are, are really quite remarkable for for one week it shows that there's great interest in our community in this that that you could achieve 32 percent especially with Winchester High School being at 17 percent so that's that's wonderful yes. I'll be curious to see how those numbers change um, now that you have an, another week or so in here um, I was curious with the um, uh, the elementary schools you, you mentioned grades three through five is there a plan for the younger kids oh yes definitely right so this is just kind of how we're staging the rollout so the goal is um, K to five certainly but we're just gonna start next week doing three to five um, but so by you know the beginning of November we're gonna be doing all grades yeah okay so that's that's just further down um, uh, after these these three weeks correct okay. right this is just kind of how I want to roll it out um, start with the older children Ms. Markham's being kind which, because she is I would just want to add to this that really we are completely dependent on state staffing mm -hmm. um, through CIC so this is a tentative rollout plan this could be accelerated if we get more staffing but currently based on what we're being told what we're experiencing and what we're being told we feel that this is really about the best we can do and as we go through we you know this October 11th and October 18th all of this um, kind of ramping this up is going to be dependent on us getting more staffing so it is truly a tentative rollout um, and uh, our, you know, I, I just want to be clear that if we had the staffing right now, the rollout would be more accelerated. And it's not really a criticism because I, I do think that they are catching up with themselves, uh, which is good. And they've been, they've really ramped up with the test and state program, which is, as you know, Jen said, it's been our focus. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Great. Mr. Nixon. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, so is this an option for our pre-K kids at VO? And if yes, do they get rolled into this? And if yes, what about the kids downstairs? Because, you know, it's only, uh, clearly there are a lot of bodies here and it's yep. a lot of work, yep. but um, the ones here are sort of segregated downstairs, but at VO less so. So the students set in the garden level here at um, Parkhurst, <laughs> yep. uh, as we like to refer to it. Um, so interestingly, this is a conversation that has come up. The testing program through the state is actually a K through 12 testing program. It is not a pre-K testing program. So the conversation that we're having with the state is one, can we, it, will they, and are they going to expand it to pre-K? And if the answer to that is no, then within our own uh, resources we will be talking about what the options would be because clearly we would want to be able to at least do the test and stay program mm -hmm. uh, for our pre-k students both here obviously in a VO so mm -hmm. um, that was kind of a thing that we just didn't even think it was going to be an issue and then all of a sudden we were talking about it and realized that in fact the, the program is limited to K through 12. Okay um, thank you and then as I was looking at the your consent grid mm -hmm. I was interested I was just running some numbers I'm I'm always happy to see who's participating but I was also actually trying to figure out who's not and what really strikes me is there's nearly almost the number of Lynch students who are not participating is almost double the number of for instance Lincoln students um, Lynch is a large school but look at the participant look at the registration rate down there and see how low it is so my mind naturally goes to like ELL I mean is there is there a language barrier um, um, we're doing a lot of things better today than we used to but can somebody sort of speak to are we, are we are we making an extra effort how do we know we're really communicating with that community where there can be more language barriers than some of the other schools where the rates are higher 
So the short answer is yes. We, um, this is the initial registrations, and we also recognize that there are some schools that, are, that seem artificially low and mm -hmm. asking the question of whether or not there could be language barriers or whether or not it's an issue of just not getting, the parents just not getting the information in the same way. Um, so the next push is to really make sure that that is happening from the school level. We kind of start out with a district and then school-based, and then we can get to a certain point where we'll be able to kind of identify grade levels that may be low or um, and continue to make the push to, for the sign up. Okay. I think one of the things that's been a little confusing and we've done the best we can, I think we've done a good job communicating and just uh, just Pfefferman at uh, the town hall and Jen Murphy as well, but has been because when they go in and sign the consent form, they're signing up for the testing program. And I think there's a hesitancy to sign up for the pooled or safety check testing. So we've got to be really clear that we're allowing that opt out and it can just be test and stay. And I do think the webinar next week will be helpful. We'll push that out hard. Okay. Yeah, Thank and you. then also um, because M M Morocco is starting next week, there'll be another big, you know, informative letter from the principals um, just to kind of remind parents. And also we found this a little bit at the high school. It kind of starts out slow sometimes. You know, we do the pool testing and then people get more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So we'll definitely keep an eye on those numbers, though. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Good. Could it also be an issue of it just doesn't apply to people yet? Have you had people sign up for test and stay when their children are identified as close contacts? Yes. Yes. That it's not real until it happens to you yes. and they're not seeing pooled testing happening. So I'm actually surprised you have this many people, a, a response rate, given that we're not running pooled testing currently, it's so nebulous. So I'm curious to see if those numbers go up once things are live and in person too. Yeah, it's true. Definitely. And just to make it clear from Michelle's point that if a student is identified as a close contact and then test and stay would be an option, will the parents be reached out to and kind of given the opportunity to opt in right then? Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a great question. I actually should have brought that up. So when we do the contact tracing, which is pretty intense, it takes a long time to kind of figure out, particularly in the bigger schools, middle school and high school. So it's pretty, you know, we're looking at seating charts, we're talking to teachers, we're really trying to figure out who those zero to three contacts, those are really, those are the kiddos that we're focusing on. And then we do send out communications um, fairly quickly. So we have, uh, and our letters are always, you know, we're, our letters are getting better every week, right? We're like, oh, we should have put that, yeah, we're learning as we go. But the communication goes out to the parents. We ask to please respond that you receive this. So we want to make sure the parents are getting the information. Um, and then there's lots of questions that follow. Um, so Jess Buffernan is, you know, she's been sending a lot of letters and she'll even write, I'm available by phone till 9.30 this evening. So there's a lot of engagement. There's a, tons of opportunity for parents to ask questions. Um, we've also found that particularly at the, um, you know, the eligible children for vaccine, sometimes we just didn't have the vaccine information. So, you know, it, we thought the child was eligible, however, the child's vaccinated. So there's a lot of back and forth and lots of communication. Yeah. I just want to thank you and, and all the nurses for all that you are doing. I, I happen to sit next to our head nurse in Melrose and I, um. I see everything that she's doing. And so I know it's just a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. Um, and it's certainly worthwhile, but that doesn't make it any easier. So thank you to all of the nurses and yeah. thank you for your leadership. Yeah, no, I know that the team, we have a fantastic nursing team, very, very, very dedicated. So thank you for that. I would echo your comments. I mean, Jen and I are contact, I think, daily, if not a little bit more, a little bit over the weekend. And just the team with Jen Murphy at the town and just Hef uh, Pfefferman has been so instrumental. We've also, we talked about, just I mentioned in the communications about Esther funding. Um, we did anticipate that there are going to be problems with staffing <coughs> potentially from the state. So we really did focus on trying to hire some additional, and I don't have to say it this way, but additional people to, uh, even if they were not schooled nurses but just people who could who qualified to do testing because we just knew that how key this was going to be for us to keep our, our students in school and um, Jen is uh, non-stop and very much appreciate your leadership as well thank you but uh, I mean I it's definitely been a team approach I mean Jess Pfeffer has been amazing um, and then so it's 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 all hands on deck and sure. don't ever text me going into a weekend again bragging oh, about our cases and how we didn't have many oh, and then never again. right okay I don't jinx that. it and <laughs> it's a lesson learned it's just a lesson learned that's all that's never all. again <laughs> so just to confirm um for the community 
um, people can families can continue to sign up for the test and stay program. Yes. And more communication will be going out sounds in the webinar. Um, yes. So the webinar is next, next Wednesday. Great. We'll send out more information, um, but you know how to join the webinar, register yep. for the webinar. And um, the website is really fantastic. And if there are specific questions, please, you know, it's actually easier to just put the question right on the website. Mm -hmm. Jess Freffman mm -hmm. actually is answering the questions mm -hmm. and then she's doing um, frequently asked questions. And actually that's sometimes, of course, how we learn that we didn't think of that, you know, so then we, you know, sometimes have to adjust. So it's, it's helpful for, on our end too. Right. Dr. Hackett, will that be able to be recorded so if parents aren't able to yeah. watch it, they can go online yes. and get that later? Thinking the same thing and also um, to the earlier point from Mr. Nixon about translation potentially of the webinar, um, we can, we'll can we look into that. Maybe not yeah. can have an interpretation live, but uh, maybe as part of the recording we might be able to, to look at that option. I think that would be important if we, we can do it. a student PBA with some of our EL kids doing the translation for different languages. I'll send an email. It's amazing to me how often <laughs> PBAs come to the rescue in this community. Uh. It's just, well, I should say in her office. So, <laughs> that's a great idea. Mr. Hopcroft. Um, so, so again, this is wonderful. Uh, I, I don't, um, I'm not sure if, if this um, dashboard of numbers is on the public site, but if, if you could come back and uh, or share with us the updates over time. I know these are our preliminary one-week numbers, and I'm very impressed, but uh, I'm also thinking about what Ms. Bergstrom and, and others were saying um, about about some of the differences here. Um, yeah, I note that Lynch and Morocco last year um, were the schools that wanted to be remote at the highest rates, um, quite a bit higher than others, and so you would think that there's a high level of awareness around COVID and things at both of those, and, and you had just noted that at least since September 15th, we haven't had a need to do test and stay at those schools. And so presumably they have similar um, profiles in terms of, of clusters or outbreaks or, or, or whatnot. So it is interesting. I, I would chalk it up at this point to not a lot of data yet. And so I'd be curious to see what happens in future weeks. But I think Mr. Nixon's point about, you know, are there barriers is a good thing to look at. And you know, I'd love to just keep monitoring that if it's, if it's not publicly available. Um, you know, keep reporting back to us it would be great so uh, just to clarify <coughs> our numbers of in school <coughs> transmit trans, in school close contacts are available on the dashboard right now I, I meant here we have people um, how, how are people signing up for okay the so the vaccine okay perfect yeah, right. sorry yeah, yeah. And, and you raise a good point which is I guess all of this is just the in-school stuff. You know, the moment the bell rings Correct. and, right. and the kid, uh, Correct. gets exposed. Correct, which count. is unfortunate, but also I know it's an issue that um, Jen, well, all of us are pushing on. Jen Murphy's been in touch. I know others in this room have been in touch with uh, legislators about, and I, th I think it's a, a known issue. Um, hopefully that we can get some additional um, broadening of what is actually school-related uh, so that we can open that up a little bit more. Thanks. Any further questions? So thank you, thank Ms. You. Markham, as <laughs> on behalf of the committee, so for your tireless work and for all of the nurses' work, so for keeping our kids safe and in school. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jen. Thank, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Okay. <laughs> Next, we will move to the student service learning update. Student service or service learning is a way to develop youth leadership and student engagement. And it affords students the chance to learn about different careers, build community, and have an opportunity for assessment. So today we are excited to have several students who will be introducing their projects from last year, as well as the service learning coordinator, Miss Anne Marie Edenhofner and Ms. Joanna Shea O'Brien, um, who is one who... Ms. Sorrell, do you want to take An Andrew has left the building? Until it showed, I say. But we did get a link to that showed three. Um, do we have a separate link for this? For this, is this presentation did yeah. that go up? on the cover sheet is a presentation that says presentation that link is it 
Oh, that's a leak. That is a link. And I'll just. I like to hide them to see how well you can get to them. Are you seeing it? No, I didn't bring up. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Try this. Got it. Got it? Got it. Yeah, thank you. So I was just looking for. For Miss O'Brien's title, <laughs> so and but now I have it up for up here, and she is Miss O'Brien. Miss Joanna O'Brien is a professional oral historian and a community volunteer and a Winchester Public Schools parent. And I, th the we Girl Scouts will be coming in shortly. They will be coming in shortly. Okay, I will hold on that. <laughs> okay. And I believe you have the power to change the slides in your hand. Okay, hopefully okay, I'll so do that correctly. I, I'm just going to sit back and not touch anything. Okay. So. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is Anne-Marie Eden-Hoffner. I'm the service learning coordinator for the district, and I also teach ninth grade history at Winchester High School. So thank you for having us come uh, to give a brief report about service learning in the past year or so. Um, even though we've all been challenged by the pandemic, uh, there has been learning going on at the schools, and in some ways, we had unique opportunities for service learning because of the pandemic. Um, I'd like to just assert that service learning is a pedagogy, meaning it's a unique style of learning. It's a way of learning. Uh, and it incorporates students doing research about issues, gathering data, um, discussing plans collaboratively with one another about how they might address important issues. Um, also, it incorporates collaborating with people in the community and even um, a meeting like this affords students the opportunity to reflect upon what they have learned and to present and share with the community what they have learned. So this is actually part of the learning process for these students to come here tonight. Part of the process also is collaboration with community members such as Joanna Shea O'Brien um, and other groups in the community like the Jenks Center or Wright Lock Farm. Uh, and the new social studies standards also emphasize civic engagement. So this is just another way that we can address state standards also with students. Um, and as I mentioned, the learning is really the students doing it. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Joanna first to talk about um, the oral history project and then we'll invite in the Girl Scouts who uh, engaged in the project. And then uh, Armand will speak about the Student Mental Health Committee at the high school. Okay. okay, I'll just pull this over. Hi, everybody. I know most of you. Nice to meet you. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody else. I'm Joanna Shea O'Brien. I'm a Winchester resident, a McCall and Morocco mother. And I'm also the co-chair of the Town Archives Advisory Committee with Nancy Schrock, who many of you might know. Through a partnership with the Town Archives, the Winchester Public Library, the Jenks Center, the Network for Social Justice, WinCam, the Winchester Historical Society, and the Winchester Public Schools Service Learning, we created a digital archive titled Winchester During COVID to document the experience of the pandemic during the last year and a half. Um, we had some fifth grade students right at the end of 2020 submit a diary entry um, through their fifth grade teachers and then we collected photos from people around town but I'm here to speak to you specifically about the oral history work we did as an oral historian I worked closely with Anne Marie and her students her ninth graders last year to train them on the principles of oral history so that they could be a part of this project and I'm incredibly proud of their contribution to the lasting archive we had about 35 interviews some students did it together as co-interviews they interviewed a lot of Winchester High School staff, teachers, um, they interviewed their friends, they interviewed their parents, people in the pharmaceutical industry and the medical world, and some town business people. And they did a great job. Um, additionally, we also have the wonderful pleasure of working with the Girl Scout troop, and they're gonna come in in a moment and I'll step over there so they can present. But um, we're really proud of the community kind of work that we did in the student involvement in this archive all of the uh, once it's all submitted and all the permissions and the processing ha is complete then we can send you a link and you guys can listen to interviews and um, kind of celebrate the historical 
success this was. We hope that this will be available in 100, 200 years for people to reflect on what it was like for Winchester during the pandemic. And we're really proud that it was led with students. Thank you. <laughs> I would be too. Do I start now? You can start in. Okay. Hello, my name is Sophie Rose Cameron. Thank you for the opportunity to for the opportunity to present our bronze award for you today. The bronze award is a Girl Scout leadership development program for girls in fourth or fifth grade. Like everyone, the COVID pandemic heavily influenced us. So we decided on a project that documents the impact of COVID on the Winchester community. We have, com we have created contribu contributions to Winchester's digital archives, such as interviews with members of the community, as well as our own personal stories and artwork. Um, what we did. My name is Sophia Liu. In the preparation, in preparation for our project, we did the following. We learned about the importance of public health. We learned about the origins, origins of vaccines. Uh, origins of vaccines. We attended a Zoom presentation with Joanna Shea O'Brien to learn about oral history in Winchester's digital archive project. We attended a Zoom presentation with Madison Murrow from the Griffin Museum of Photo Photography to learn about how photos can capture the moment. Hello, my name is Maya Lau McIntyre. In total, we interviewed nine members of the community, including teachers, principals, students, business owners, nurses, and scientists. We each wrote personal letters to our future grandchildren about our experience during COVID, and we created artwork and poetry. In total, we spent a collective of 90 hours on the project. Something that I learned from this project was the full extent of how much changes the businesses and people had to make during this time. Hello, my name is Alexandra Hale. Documenting our experience during COVID contribute, contributes to the historical record. It makes a primary source, meaning documents, photos, and artwork that have not been altered, and, altered or changed over time. It allows people to connect with, other pers with others' personal stories. Through this, we have learned our experience during COVID has many commonalities with people's experience 100 years ago and during the Spanish influenza. Everyone wore masks and socially distanced. Many people felt isolated and scared, just like our experience. We all hope that soon we will be able to call COVID-19 history. Hello, my name is Maddie Delore. Just for fun, we brainstormed a few words that we've been frequently used during the pandemic. These include COVID-19, coronavirus, mask, quarantine, six feet, pandemic, Hand sanitizer, Zoom cohorts, pods, soap, remote, remote, uh, um, oh. vaccines, Uber Eats, takeout, movie night, and hopeful. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sarah Krizikta. We have so many people to thank, including the people we interviewed, Ernest <coughs> O'Brien, Madison Moore from the Griffin Museum of Photography, healthcare workers, and other frontline workers. Teachers, our parents, kids without flexibility, COVID for teaching us how to adapt. And finally, we thank those who created and distributed the vaccine to help us get back to normal. Thank you, girls, and congratulations on winning the bronze award. I just want to acknowledge as a Girl Scout dad myself, it's a lot of work to do this. It's a long path, so congratulations to all of you. I love the subject that you picked, and I hope that you guys are inspired to go to a silver next. And gold. This, this, this is going to go one step at a time. But yes. <laughs> uh, mine didn't get there. Um, 
<laughs> you're learning some really important lessons that are going to serve you well as you get older. Um, and be sure you put this on your resume when you're applying to college because it matters. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank of you. you very much for sharing. Great job. Work. Really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. So as Ms. Edenhofer said, I'm a current junior at Winchester High School and I'm one of the representatives at the Student Council. And last year, um, me and my uh, committee, the Mental Health Committee, participated in the SCI Pitch Contest. So um, it was by the SCI Social Capital Inc. of Woburn. And they essentially invited other st uh, student clubs like Student Council and Connect and Commit in Woburn and Winchester, so not just Winchester was here, to participate in a nonprofit pitch contest, which was made possible through a grant from Lady Health. Over the course of two months, we uh, developed pitch presentations for funding for projects that address mental health, and I will be presenting our project that the Mental Health Committee did very shortly. The three Winchester student groups participated in weekly training sessions with the volunteer professionals to develop their pitches and made their pitches to SCI volunteers on April 29th, and two of the three groups from Winchester awarded funds. The Connected and Commit group got a $1,000 grant, <coughs> and my group, the Mental Health Committee group, got $650. As I previously stated, I am a, uh, my name is Armin Bagdasarian, I'm a junior, I'm a student council representative, and I'm part of the Mental Health Committee, and we are here because we want to make Winchester High School safer for students. We believe that through many small efforts, we can leave a lar large impact um, on the mental health of our peers. So our goal is to create a room that is a very welcoming and open atmosphere. To accomplish this, we will have a coffee table, Yoke Bo bean bags, a nugget couch, chairs and side tables spaced throughout the room. One of our pieces of furniture will include a large bookshelf. We will store many items to, uh, to allow students to engage in stress reduction activities um, in the room as well. These include fidget toys, uh, coloring books, markers, um, French bracelet strings, yoga, ma yoga mats, free flow public journals, and even board games. Um, there will also be decorations throughout the room, such as plants and succulents, aromatherapy diffusers, and more. Um, bookshelves will also hold cards by a mental health organization called Active Minds and other self-help books. Another way we will design the open space is by decorating the walls with a mural created by WHS students and a bulletin board for students to ask any questions that they might have. Um, there will also be QR codes uh, pasted around the walls of the room um, that have resources such as playlists and Google Drives filled with resources for self-help. Due to there being no natural lighting in the room, we plan on using vitamin D lights and other projectors to simulate the natural relaxing fuel that that light gives. Every piece of equipment has been carefully selected for the WinRec room based off of our self-conducted student survey and hours of research to build a calming environment. So to bring engagement to the room and eliminate the stigma of it, we wish to install proactive methods through events. One way we would accomplish this is by inviting guest speakers to talk about their experiences and host workshops. Guest speakers that our group invite to the school will be beneficial for everyone, and several of our visitors will host mental health conversations to uh, aid various minority groups at school. A major contributor to our proactive methods is mental health expert Dana Altman. Dana has developed a number of mental health advocacy organizations of her own, and her forays into entrepreneurship have helped her become a professional speaker, documentary filmmaker, and author of two books, while using food to host one of her workshops that have helped her become all of these professional things. Uh, she has offered to host one of her own workshops for Winchester High School students, and our group is more than thrilled to work with her and any other future guest speakers. Other events that we would look further into hosting is maybe a day that uh, students could dedicate to creating stress balls, paintings, other activities, so that they can develop new coping mechanisms. Um, to attract more students to the room, we can give the opportunity for teachers to book room for their own classes, um, this room might be helpful for the speech and debate class or any of the psychology classes at school. And we would find other ways to promote the room through collaborations with other committees and clubs at our own school. The awareness committee at our school has uh, spreads awareness on social causes each month, and we plan to highlight mental health more consistently through their help. 
Uh, thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Um, are there any questions? I, I would I just found start. my new office. Excuse me. Well, <laughs> I was just going to start and ask it whether the central office can yeah. reserve the room, but. <laughs> Not a question, but a comment. I just wanted to say it, it's so impressive that you and your peers are focused on mental health and the mental health of you and your peers. And I think you're really setting a great example. And a lot of times we as adults don't always have that same focus. So I thank you for that leadership and kind of reminding us all that it's really, really important. Um, and you taking the time to look out for your peers and do all this work and successfully um, be awarded the grant. It's just really, really impressive. They, not to date myself, but we certainly did not have anything like that when I was in high school. <laughs> and I, I still think back where we could have used it. And so I, I just really appreciate what you and, and your team has done. Yeah, especially with COVID, uh, I think, especially resources like these, um, with the school being the way it was, it was hard to come by. So we want to make sure that it is there for those who need it. I know you have limited time, and the student that was on the other committee that awarded the grant was unable to come this evening. But I can just let you know the other grant was for a collaborative project um, that the high school students um, piloted last year and planned to continue in the future where high school students volunteered to zoom into elementary classrooms <coughs> to read topical books. And it was popular not just with high school students, but actually with elementary school teachers. Um, I would say over 20 teachers, maybe about 30 teachers participated in the program. Elementary school kids love having older students to look up to, makes them feel special and it makes the high school students feel special also. And using the word special minimizes the role that it plays in social emotional learning also. So um, I'm really proud of that group also for the work they did to also um, make the pitch and, and they have the pride of knowing that they were able to make a presentation and get those funds themselves, which again is all part of that wonderful social emotional learning experience from service learning. So thanks. I'm on Thank you all for allowing me to give this presentation. Thank you. Thank for you taking very time. much. Thank you very much. Miss uh, Miss Edenhofer, so oh, whoops. <laughs> oh. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I was hoping that there would be a brief update on the Winchester High School Zen Garden, um, which uh, we had seen um, in previous years. The we have seen the proposal come to us with the students um, and. Uh, the student, the high school student, or the, I believe the seniors who had graduated last year um, had been completely in charge of that from concept to planning uh, to bringing it to fruition, uh, fundraising and bringing it to fruition. And I wish that we had been able to hear a little bit about that tonight, but it looks as if, I'm not sure if you could flash up this, the picture, but it looks as if the garden is complete um, I believe it was targeted to be complete at the beginning of this year, and it is real. It looks like a lovely space for students to visit, and our community as well. Let me see if I can bring it up. It's number it's twenty-five. Like, Thank you. Yes. has its running water and the concentric circles. Yes, I remember when they were talking about this. So. And it's unfortunate that they don't have a before picture on this as well, because I believe that it was a, if I'm remembering correctly, Mr. Nixon, perhaps a picnic table or two in the middle of a great big green space that was well, not well, well you utilized. Said before, I was in the long ago. I was oh, you're in the say, way back. So that's where the modulus went. It was an asphalt parking lot. Right. <laughs> you're, in, you're in the other way back machine. <laughs> I'm about long range improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I remember Beautiful. the planning that went into yes. that and the dedication and the fundraising. Uh, of the students. So 
Um, a big thank you to them. Uh, and a thank you to all of the students for introducing their projects to us. It was really fun and informative for us to see what they've been doing um, and what different schools at the high school and what our Girl Scouts in the community have been doing in these <laughs> unique opportunities. Uh, so next on our agenda is assignment of a representative for the energy manage or to the energy management committee. Um, and according to an order from the select board, this is a person who is designated by the superintendent and who is from the school department, not the school committee. So therefore, this is not for school committee action, actually. Ms. Dr. Hackett. Thank you. No, that was, um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate um, Mr. Nixon provided the, uh, went into the historical archives, I think, to find the, uh, the founding document for the Energy Management Committee. Um, now that Andrew Marin is not in the room, I'm pleased to announce that Andrew <laughs> Marin <laughs> will be assigned to the Energy <laughs> Management Committee. Um, I can, I can, I think I can speak for him when I say that he's excited about it. Uh, <laughs> and actually, in all, all joking aside, uh, it's a, it is a great assignment for Andrew. Um, he's, you know, he's worked with me and. Um, in a lot of facilities work um, in the past and has been involved in design and planning uh, and also quite honestly in, in energy management projects both as a school employee and as a town employee in his, pre his prior life. So uh, I will be going along with Andrew for the first couple of meetings just to kind of introduce and get a sense and um, obviously available um, as, as needed. So that is really uh, just an announcement to let you know that's what we will do. So thank you. And can I just clarify, if I may, so that vacancy comes because Ms. Woodamore has left the yep. district, so she was serving previously. Thank you. Great. Right. Um, so thank you very much. It is now 6.41 p.m., and we will move into action items, beginning with consideration of approval of central office relocation. So we've discussed central office relocation a number of times over the course of this year as well as going back over many years and most recently on September 9th TAPE Architects had presented to school committee their study on the carriage house option for central office as well as considerations if it were to go to the Lynch MSBA project and last night Dr. Hackett, Mr. Nixon, our project managers from Hill um, from Hill, Vivian Varbedian and Andy Vo and I met with the select board to recap the project and take their feedback and questions. So Mr. Nixon will now share his, uh, this short presentation with us and our viewers to summarize what we have been talking about over the last month and provide some clarity for many of the questions that we've had about the Carriage House um, uh, over the years and some of our thoughts on the Lynch site and project. Mr. So Nixon. Sure, we're gonna, and we're gonna try to merge some technology here, so bear with me. If this doesn't work, Dr. Hackett's gonna have to bail me out. Oh, we already did that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna make that pop okay, up, dis you. disappear. <laughs> there we go. So um, as Karen said, we had a, a, we had a brief summary last night with the select board. In particular, we were asked to kind of condense some of the key issues that we've been talking about, this comparison and contrast. So things like timing, cost, uh, logistics, challenges, opportunities, or if you wanna think of them as pros and cons. I also just wanna take a moment, if I may, and just you know, recognize there were some, some, some thoughtful and appropriate questions we heard during uh, public comment tonight as well. And hopefully you know, we can address this as we go, as we go through. Um, so as we go through these slides, you're just going to see uh, the comparison and contrast. We'll have Carriage House on the left and Lynch on the right. So first of all, so here's sort of what we, what we know. Uh, with respect to construction cost, the Carriage House is estimated at just under $4.4 million. That's based on a very detailed schematic design estimate that you will recall from the TAPE presentation on the 9th and the report that has been shared with everyone. The construction cost at Lynch, on the other hand, is a little bit of a range. It's about 4.1 to four and a quarter. And I wanna be really clear about where that comes from. Um, these are based on uh, unit costs from a professional cost estimator, numbers we received in the spring, presumptions around 
bidding uh, as late as January of 24, but still based on what the market looked like last spring. Um, and it is not based on a design like we have for the carriage house. It's more of the concept that comes from the master plan. This comes from PMNC. Um, it's an estimator that has a lot of experience in Winchester and with other districts. They've got a pretty good grasp of what the market looks like uh, for MSBA elementary schools. And so to be more specific about where this number comes from, we currently are projecting the construction cost for the new Lynch, I mean the whole school, at between 46 and $48 million. That's construction cost. So that does not include things like um, architect, engineering fees, testing, survey, uh, swing space as an example, that add up fixtures, furnishings, equipment, desks, drawers, chairs, educational technology, and so forth. So there are many elements that actually then build up to project cost. And the reason why we make this distinction between construction cost and project cost is, I'm gonna make an analogy. If there is a, let's say, 100,000 square foot school that we wanted to build in Winchester, and it was identical in every way to one that uh, the Arlington public schools were gonna build, identical in every way, then we would expect to see the same construction cost for things like the framing, the, the carpentry, um, the labor, et cetera, that would be necessary to build these two identical schools. That makes sense. But what's not different between those two schools would be who's building it, who's the contractor, <clears throat> um, uh, who was the architect that ge generated these very similar designs, what are the constraints of the site? Is it a contaminated site? Are there wetlands? Are there special environmental issues that need to be addressed? Um, is swing space gonna be necessary in Winchester or in Arlington? If it is in one and not in the other, that's going to affect cost. So project cost is really where we sort of take, we take consideration for how, what are the needs of this particular project and all of the costs that typically come on the owner to make it to make it happen outside of literally the labor and materials, which is another way to think about it. So, and I was encouraged to sort of make that distinction, so I hope that makes some sense. So we have, um, we have a range uh, for construction cost at Lynch, and what we learned from TAP A is it's very similar. It's substantially the same as it is for the carriage house. So then we move to project cost. We actually do have a really good sense of what the project cost would be at the carriage house because we do have a detailed design. We have an architect on board who has some experience with the various contingencies that we would carry and what design fees might be and so forth. And you all have this information in the report, so we, we don't need to get into that detail. And as we all know, um, the carriage house is not reimbursed um, by the MSBA or anybody else. We have to find a way to pay for it. Some small exception might be that if we're fortunate enough in working with the historic commission and finding some historic preservation grants, um, any number of people have expressed the interest in helping to you know, make that happen, uh, but there's no guarantee and we wouldn't have any expectation we'd find you know, grants to cover that kind of cost. Uh, but that's certainly something we could pursue. As TAPE presented on the 9th, <clears throat> it's sort of more difficult to make a hard comparison to project cost at Lynch because we don't yet know what the Lynch design looks like. But what they did say is you can safely assume the project costs will be similar. There are many assumptions into this and we really can't compare them, you know, apples to apples until we get a design. So what we kind of have to do is use the information we have to make a decision. I want to just clarify too, because we heard from, um, I think it was from Ms. Blackwell tonight um, forgive me, I'm just sort of go back. She was just referring to the fact that Carriage House, we believe might cost around six million and Lynch, she's hearing 4.2. So this is an important distinction to make. They're actually virtually identical from a construction cost point of view. And based on what we know, we believe they would be virtually the same from a project cost point of view. So 4.2 is one thing, six is another. So then we talk about timing. Um, as we know, um, uh, subject to finding the money, uh, we could have the carriage house available as early as the fall of 23, substantial completion by that summer. With Lynch, our goal has been and continues to be fall of 25, substantial completion, <coughs> excuse me, of the summer of 25. Although we have, <coughs> we've lost some time with the MSBA in that transition from eligibility to feasibility and kind of pinning down the design enrollment, 
Um, our OPM is, is still hopeful that we can hit that date, but believe me, this is, I think, going to be one of the first things we really get into with our architect once they're selected, is underscoring how important this date is to Winchester. But we're looking at about two years difference. And so then we talk about the funding piece. So, of course, if we pursue the carriage house, we have to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, as Tape indicated on the 9th, if we secure funding in the spring, we could get going and easily make that date. Given um, when we're going to be bidding the work for Lynch, which I'll get into in a moment, even if securing the funding doesn't happen in the spring, if it comes a little later, even as late as the fall, it doesn't necessarily put this building in jeopardy as swing space. It just pushes back the availability of Carriage House. So it would be highly unlikely Carriage House would be available by the fall of 23, more likely kind of January 24, something in that time frame. Just sort of think for a moment, if you lose six months with town meeting, you lose six months on the other end. So, but that could still free up the building in time to be used for swing space. And then of course with Lynch, um, to recap the funding, this is a two-step process that's required. We envision a fall town meeting 2022 and then subsequently a, a debt exclusion override for the project, much like we did with Winchester High School <clears throat> and with VO. When the MSBA um, gives us the green light to proceed on the project, they, when they approve the, the project schematic report, we have 120 days as a town to secure funding. And so within that 120 day window, we have to both get town meeting approval and then we go to the voters. So there's only two ways to do that. Either we go with a regular town meeting and then we have a special election, which is the way we've done it for both the high school and VO, or alternatively, we could put the question on a regular ballot, have a regular election, and then we have a special town meeting. Just wanted to throw that out there in case people have that question. Um, and the last note here um, is that if, if central office program should be included in the new Lynch school, it does not require a separate question. So although we can talk about how, as we believe right now, the cost of that is around $6 million, what that would effectively do is just increase the cost and the size of Lynch. So there would still be one project funding agreement. There would be one debt exclusion override question. One of the risk factors associated with this option, however, is that it still requires the MSBA's approval. So we had last night at the virtual table with us, <coughs> Vivian Varbedian, who's the project director with Hill, and I think she did a, a pretty good job explaining sort of the timing of this, that we have, we've communicated to the MSBA through the eligibility period and statement of interest sort of what it is we're looking for. And on the basis of that, they've made the invitation. We have been very clear with them that we are evaluating where the future home should, of central office should be, and they know that we're considering Lynch. But it's not in our program right now, and we haven't told them that it is. And they require us um, to tell them almost immediately if that's what we want to do as we're about to bring the designer on board. And then there's this, unfortunately, kind of a long process to get to the preferred schematic report that then gets submitted. The MSBA is going to require the design team with the EFPBC and Hill to sort of make the case that central office at Lynch not only works, I put that in air quotes, but it, it really works well. Like that is, that's really the best place to put it. Um, and it has you know, little to no impact on the adjacency of other educational program spaces and so forth. The MSBA has told us explicitly that we should not assume that they will allow it. Although they do allow it in, in I can point to many instances where they've allowed it. They've also opted not to in other instances. And so they've told us they would be in a position to render a judgment by September of 22. So that's a year from now. So there's some consequences of that in terms of design and planning. Um, but, but if the school committee said Lynch is where we need to go, then it just simply means we need to focus on kind of articulating that message and making that presentation really strong. So then on to kind of challenges and opportunities. On the opportunity side with the carriage house, of course, we're making use of an existing school department asset. This would have no impact of any kind on the new Lynch school's planning or design priorities. That means um, uh, an adjacency of a piece of program, uh, the relationship of one element to another, both sort of horizontally, vertically, how the building might be sited, 
um, relationships to maybe play spaces, drop off, pick up, and so forth. Uh, imagine that if you're working with a building that's one size versus a building that's 9% larger and, and central office has to be in that building somewhere, it's taking some space. So one can sort of imagine you have more flexibility if you don't have that element in it. So in terms of cost avoidance, I go back to kind of that challenge when we talk about comparatively $6 million of project cost of carriage house versus Lynch. So one of the areas of concern has to do with that two-year spread. So remember, we, we don't plan to bid the Lynch work until January or February of 24. So there is an additional two years of cost escalation. We know there will be cost escalation, but if you really look over a long span of time, you look over the last 10 years, you can have escalation of as little as 1% and a quarter. In some years, it's 2% and a quarter. And we just don't have that crystal ball. So there's a risk factor there in terms of being able to pinpoint how much higher it might go than what we've estimated. So that's just sort of a scenario of concern. What I've highlighted for you in yellow is interesting. Hill just came back to us this week to address this question. We, we understand, I think we can all understand, if Parkhurst was vacant and could be available as some measure of swing space to assist in the construction and the design and construction of the Lynch School, what would that actually be worth? What, what would we be saving if we otherwise had to rent? We would not be purchasing, of course, but if we, if we had to rent modulars for a couple of years for construction, they're telling us that this space is worth at least two to $3 million in terms of cost avoidance. And the reason that swing space has come up, and I should have brought my stack of proposals tonight, but I'd, I'd have to cover them in brown paper because we're, it's we're not supposed to be sharing that yet. Um, we're hearing really loud and clear from the architectural teams that some measure of swing space is going to be necessary to execute the Lynch project. Some firms have been really explicit. They've even suggested what you really should do is move the rec department kids corner out of Mystic. I hope Nick's not watching tonight um, or Andrew for that matter. Uh, but they're quick to say if that's not possible because they recognize and they've been around town, they've looked, we don't have a place to put them. But they've gone on to say, if that's not possible, if you can find a way to move central office out of Parkhurst, you could certainly use that space to help facilitate Lynch. And what they're really talking about is that when we talk about the new Lynch, I think certainly since we voted the master plan, our ideal Lynch, our idealized Lynch is a new building. It's built somewhere sort of across from the existing. We stay in the existing building that we have and then when the kids move in, we sort of tear down the existing building. And it sounds nice, sounds easy. Um, that's sort of what we did with VO, but we were able to do that at VO because we were able to move those students into Parkhurst. The challenge we have here is that the Lynch School today is considerably larger than VO was. When the VO students came into this building, and the chair has memory of this, I think, as a parent perspective, we only were accommodating 14 sections of students. VO was a much smaller school than it is today. That allowed us to move the kids out, tore down VO, we built a new building, VO students were here. But the MSBA still required us to look at a number of options, including adaptive reuse of that existing building, if you can believe it, some you know, gutting it down to the frame and adding onto it and elevators and so forth to make it accessible, which if you think about it, is exactly what we just did at Winchester High School. So Winchester High School to the layperson looks like a brand new building, but most of it's been standing since 1970. So as a part of the feasibility study, the MSBA is going to require us and the architect to really look hard at the Lynch that we have today. Are there elements of Lynch that can and should be preserved um, and expanded in some way? It's hard to know really where that's gonna take us, but what we're hearing from the architects and from Hill is that in any kind of phased renovation construction approach, the value of swing space is gonna be crucial, including in a new build scenario. So this is really some new information we received since um, Tape's presentation. So I think about that two to three million as kind of a cost avoidance element. We're not really saving money, but I, I think of it as cost avoidance. And then of course we have this opportunity to preserve a historic resource. With Lynch, I think we all recognize immediately at the opportunity of Lynch is it's just such a simplified process, right? So 
Again, it requires the MSBA's approval, but it gets integrated into the building, and it's one question. And as challenging as the site is, both in terms of its sort of the physical orientation, the topography, the wetlands, 100-year floodplain, it is still a clean sheet design. I mean, we would be starting from scratch, um, and the design team would approach a central office design with the same sort of care and feeding they would to educational space. And then lastly, we talk about challenges with respect to the carriage house, of course, because it has to be funded separately, and the goal would be certainly to do it on a shorter time frame to therefore free up this space for swing space for Lynch. It's a shorter runway to find that funding. We do, of, of course, have between 17 to 20 FTEs will be in that building, so we'll have some traffic, just like we do today and just like we did at Lynch when Central Office was there. Um, the question had come up, you know, what is the concept for, for, for parking at the carriage house? There is an area that's already designated by the lease that was developed between the Select Board and the Historical Society and subsequently approved by town meeting about, I don't know, nine years ago, 10 maybe. A special area that designates for future parking expansion. And so that was provided to TAP A, uh, and they have come up with a scenario that you've seen in the report. Interestingly, the Historical Society on their own had gone to an architect and landscape architect to look at some options for expanded parking. It's a completely different design approach within the same area, and it yields actually more parking, so that's very interesting to us. Um, they've shared that with, uh, with the chair and the superintendent. And what we have committed to them is that should the school committee wish to pursue the carriage house, we would want to work with both the Historical Society and the Ambrose community to try to find a solution that kind of works best for everybody's needs. And we certainly recognize there's concern about wh wh where's everybody going to park, as well as how do we manage traffic. On the Lynch side, the challenges are that that $6 million, of course, is added to the Lynch project cost. So what you haven't heard me say tonight is, what do we think the Lynch project cost is going to be? So if it's 46 to $48 million on the construction side, we can confidently expect that the project cost for Lynch will be over $60 million. It could easily be in the mid-60s based on what we understand today. So central office going in, bringing a $6 million you know, additional cost can certainly push it into the 70s. The needs for swing space, depending upon if, if how much of swing space do we have, can we make available versus additional modulars would of course add to the cost. And then there's the intangibles, which are what would Lynch ultimately come to look like. So the design itself naturally is going to drive um, project cost. But in addition to the dollars, um, the Lynch that we envision from the master plan and that the MSBA has decided to partner with us, we believe is around 91,000 square feet, accommodating 520 K-5 students. I want to put that in perspective. Vincent Owen opened in 2013 for 420 students. We're talking about a Lynch that's going to accommodate up to 100 more students. And in addition, we're bringing pre-K back. And as we discussed at the last meeting, a bigger pre-K. And we, we have grown as a district, and there's certainly a lot of demand for additional pre-K services. So we're going to be expanding pre-K by 20%, just in terms of space. How we use that extra classroom, whether it's morning and afternoon session or an all day, that of course is a long way down the road, but it presents the opportunity to add at least 20% more sections and uh, possibly more. So the point is, it's a large building and everybody on the design team right now expects that the new Lynch, kind of like VO, is a three-story design solution, again, given the challenges of the site. And so think for a moment that uh, at that kind of square footage, the central office component represents about an additional 9%. So uh, at times we kind of described the Lynch project as a bit like building a ship in a bottle. Uh, it's a very exciting design challenge. This would mean sort of building a 9% bigger ship in a bottle. Um, so there are site and design challenges that come with that, um, as well as perhaps tip, you know, just putting another thumb on the scale in terms of swing space demands as well as certainly construction, just the means and methods of construction. So you've got to have site access for vehicles, you have to have lay down areas for materials and so forth. So, and these are some of the concerns that Hill, I think, has already kind of articulated. Uh, but it can be done. I mean, it, 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 there, there are real challenges that architects and engineers rise to as well as uh, con constructors. 
of course, we would be tying up Parkhurst until 25 <clears throat> and not making the building vacant. And then just like the carriage house, we have that same kind of additional traffic that we'd be bringing to the site. So think for a moment how challenging and really all of our elementary schools struggle with this, especially when the weather is lousy, the drop off, the pickup, congestion and so forth. Um, I've certainly been hearing for years and I've seen some of the challenges we have at Lynch. Um, imagine how much bigger Lynch is going to be. So we're going to be bringing more students, more staff, more teachers onto that site. If we add central office, it, it's just that it's a little more um, and we need to be aware of that. Um, that was the summary of sort of the key characteristics. We had some backup slides and there was a question about Parkhurst came up last night. We didn't get into these slides last night, but we heard some at public comment. So if, if, if you guys feel like it's appropriate, we can, we can talk about that for a moment. Um, we, we've thought a lot about why not just stay where we are. We, why do we really need to be making this decision? Um, Parkhurst is about 28,000 square feet. It's a, it's a classroom building. It's not office space. <clears throat> this is our only swing space option for Lynch. We don't have space anywhere else <clears throat> that can accommodate both phase construction <clears throat> or as well a, a new build um, or renovation. You've heard me describe already the, the, the cost avoidance piece and swing space that Hill estimates at two to three million. The piece that I, I was able to address with the select board last night though is that this building that we're in right now has about $15 million in renewal and replacement cost estimated by our facilities database that the town facilities and engineering department maintains. This is a database that we used, for instance, on the successful override last spring with Morocco. So the database projected around $3 million of needs at Morocco. So that captures things like the roof, the, the, the tired and failing electrical, does not pick up things like the boilers because those boilers, as we all remember, were pretty new. So that was a bit of an, an aberration. So we had to throw that into the, the ballot question. Uh, the tired masonry at Morocco and so forth all kind of get picked up. So we use that database from time to time to tell us kind of what's coming in terms of capital cost. We also use this database to make the case to the MSBA on Lynch. Lynch is the largest sort of renewal and, and replacement cost obligation we have in all of our school buildings, far and above even what we have at Morocco. So that's what it helped make the case really with the MSBA. So with respect to Parkhurst, we have a lot of expenses coming in this building if we are to use it long term. So I, I wanted to address in, in Ms. DeLeo's comments and public comment I were really good because it made me just go back. I made a couple of notes. This building has been mothballed for many, many years. We have used Parkhurst from time to time when it's sort of been convenient. Um, when I moved to Winchester in like 1999, I think the Bartlett School was either just was about to move out or it just moved out as a private school. So we were renting the building. There was a revenue stream to the town, much like we have at the lower level of Mystic. Um, but they moved out. The building sat vacant. In 2004, we used Parkhurst as swing space for the construction of the Ambrose Elementary School. But we did not address the full needs of this building at the time. We made minimal investments because we were just needed the building to just house students safely for a couple of years while Ambrose was built from 04 to 06. And then it was mothballed again when Ambrose opened up. And here it sat until 2011 when we realized we were going to need it for VO. And we put about 1.2, 1.3 million dollars into the building once again to use it on a short-term basis. And as the committee is well aware, when we did that, the State Architectural Access Board said, you may use the full building, but only for VO students. And when they're out of here, you may only use the upper level. You may not use the lower level until you make it accessible. And that's what has driven the elevator project that's now here today. So now the building is fully accessible, but still has all these many sort of facility needs. So the roof, is band-aids and duct tape that I think you've heard me describe before. Uh, we have chimneys that are falling apart up there. Uh, we've got some significant electrical needs in the building and a heating plant that would need to be replaced. Not necessarily in the short term. This is, I mean, we're here for a reason. Central office is here. We have pre-K downstairs. This is a safe building to be in and it meets our needs kind of in the short term. But to address the question that came from Mr. Mucci, 
if central office were to stay here long term then there are real costs that are coming this roof is going to have to be replaced masonry will have to be repaired and you all have seen the windows that are broken and so on throughout the building so there's just a significant cost obligation that's associated with that um, and with that I think I'm done that was longer than what we presented to the select board, but I wanted to be sure. Sorry, just wanted to be sure we addressed the public yeah, comment. Absolutely. Um, you want to disconnect me over there, and then you can jump back to whatever you want, Dr. Hackett. So I would um, only add that um, being new, I think I can offer a perspective on this that isn't tied to what what any of the history has been with any of this, uh, this these projects or in even really, um, I, I have been as a superintendent in many different spaces, some of which have been um, difficult, some of which have been nice. Uh, I've been in schools, I've been in separate buildings. Um, as I look at just this project, and I, I one thing that does strike me that I just wanna go back to this particular slide and it's, it's it is small but I've also done a lot of I have actually been involved and fortunate enough to be involved in quite a few construction projects both here in Massachusetts but also in in Maine there is only one other site that I would say in my experience that I have been uh, with in, in a building project that is not as tight as this but tight and when when you look at the Lynch site, and I know the architects and the site engineers will do a tremendous job with all kinds of options, but as Mr. Nixon said earlier, we have we did receive quite a few uh, proposals. Most of them had a scenario, whether it was a new build or ad reno, that had swing space. So they're they're truly I don't I don't know, and I'm sure there probably is, but I cannot see a way in which this project can be done regardless of ad reno or or new construction without the need for swing space so it could be that they pull that they would need to pull out two grade levels of of students and we would need to find a space for them how we do swing space on the site with construction um, i think is a significant question uh, just in terms of the access to the site and the amount of room that is available for the construction project itself. Um, in you know, without revealing anything in a couple of the scenarios with new builds, uh, it was very close to the existing building. So building the new building kind of just across the playground from the existing building. So and you know this site is better than I do. You know how it's how we access it just thinking about construction traffic just thinking about dust just think, all those things to me um, are just make it a challenging project <clears throat> in light of all that i would also just say that obviously depending on whether i don't see any reason any way that this does not become a more vertical school whether it's a two-story sections or the potentially even three-story sections i think that to kind of reduce the impact of the overall footprint of the building on the site it's going to have to go vertical and i think we saw, kind of saw that reflected in some of the proposals i independent of the carriage house whether the carriage house completely take the carriage house off the table i don't think that this is a good location for central office because i think it is going to have an impact on the design of lynch i think we are going to be competing for space whether it's ad reno or whether it's new construction on a already tight site that I think could potentially compromise um, what is available for Lynch and potentially even programmatically. Thinking about two entrances, thinking about all those things that we know that we would want to have in that building. And again, I truly say that independent of the carriage house, I know that uh, there have been concerns raised about the traffic and what is already also a tight site um, at Ambrose. Um, I don't think we compete as a central office with our employees for um, access to the site at the same time of day. I, and I think we can control for that. But I would almost rather to say, um, I would, I mean, it, I think to me, it feels like Lynch should be just taken off the table regardless of what happens. Because I just, I really am concerned, um, one, that we get to the end of this, the MSBA says you can't put it there. 
but that's independent. But I just think it is already uh, already a very challenging uh, project, and I think that us complicating it by adding nine percent or so um, additional uh, square footage doesn't help the situation. So. I kind of came to that over the weekend, just thinking about, you know, if we were starting from scratch, what would we do? And if anything was, you know, if there were other options, or I, I don't think that this would be the one that I would feel good about um, as an educ as just, you know, as, a, as an administrator, as an educational leader in the school system. So again, I offer that just kind of objectively, kind of independently from the other conversation about if not there, if not care shows, you know, where. So for what it's worth. So Mr. Nixon, then I have a question for you. When did this site become so constrained? Because I went back and looked at our notes of when we made the decisions to prioritize Lynch over Morocco. And the conversation that we had at this table was one of the reasons we prioritized Lynch over Morocco was because we would be able to build on the site next to Lynch, next to the current Lynch Elementary therefore leaving Lynch standing to use a swing space because we considered the option at that time that Parkhurst was not going to be large enough to use as swing space for the size of the number of students that were in Lynch. And we even had long conversations about keeping Lynch standing while we rebuilt Morocco and using the old Lynch as swing space for a new Morocco. So I'm curious where we got bad advice along the way that Clearly, this site is not the site that it was supposed to be. So I don't know I would frame it as bad advice. I would say I remember those discussions a little differently than you do. There, were, there was a, a member in particular who was certainly an advocate for building a new Lynch and then hanging on to the old one so we could use it, as you just mentioned, for that swing space for Morocco. I expressed some concern at the time that I didn't think the MSBA was going to go for that because um, if you have a scenario, so let's say like, um, let's say you have a scenario where you build a new Lynch across from the existing and then you move those Lynch kids into the new building, you now have a vacant building. The MSBA would reimburse their share for the cost of abating and right. taking down that building. Right. But it's a different animal if you say, MSBA, can you just let us use that building for like five or six more years while we build a new elementary school so we can move people in? And we've subsequently had those conversations. They, they have no appetite for that. So I personally was skeptical, actually, that that was going to work. Um, you know, we, my memory of those conversations were that Lynch was six years older than Morocco, was in poorer condition, which it was. We had some lengthy conversations about this. It represented a bigger value to the town for partnership with the MSBA on Lynch in terms of the costs, you know, that we would incur. That ultimately was my motivation. I felt like the, the sort of the constructability issues around building a new Morocco, particularly if we're able to, and we can't presume that this would work, but, but I think we've begun to kick around this idea at one point. Maybe we're asking to the, going to the select board and this idea of a new Morocco perhaps even on Leonard Field. Correct, and then that was we, discussed And then at the we time move too. into that building, yep. and then you take down Morocco, and now you restore the Morocco site to the recreational space that it used to be. Has a lot of appeal. Um, and then of course, as I think you remember, we also were very clear that because we submitted SOIs on both schools to the MSBA, whichever school the MSBA said they were interested in partnering with us would be the school that we would want to put in pre-K. So if they had said yes to Morocco, we'd be having a conversation right now about a Morocco with a pre-K. Um, we know the site is constrained, and we've known it for years because that very site on the right was one of the sites that we had to look at for Winchester High School. We looked at, I think, seven different sites, including the town forest. They made us look at um, the field across from the West Side Fire Station, across from, um, mm -hmm. I'm forgetting the name of the field, Mullen? Mullen, Mullen Field. Mullen. They even made us look at Mount Pisgah. And for those who don't know, yep. it's the highest point in Winchester behind this building, and there's an abandoned water tank from 1914 up there. I mean, how would you even get to the top of Mount Pisgah? But they made us look at it. There were a lot of concerns about this site. It, lo it looks appealing in the image because we have the large fields, but the 100-year floodplain cuts substantially across the fields, and so there's some environmental issues associated with that as well as the abandoned well field. So what the master plan told us was there's room to put a, a building but remember, it's right. a master plan, so it's not schematic design. That we're now at a point 
where we're saying, so how, how would you do that? How do you actually build a building while you keep the existing, and not just keep that existing building, but how do you accommodate drop-off, pick-up, playtime, playgrounds, etc.? And I, from my point of view, I think those diagrams are very clear. You could have a new building here, but there are some serious questions about how you actually facilitate that. So I think what we're hearing for right now from the OPM and the intimation from the architects is that as tight as this site is, it does not, it does not rule out that new build, a three-story, it does not rule it out. But how you get there may very likely involve swing space. And that to me is the new angle because we're hearing that from multiple teams who are putting great value on this and just strongly, and I mean, I invite the superintendent to say this more eloquently because he was part of the you know, selection team that kind of came up with a short list. It is clear to us from multiple firms that the need is there. Now, some of them have come out and said, you really just need to move all the students out. And they talk about the noise, the dust, disruption to learning, which we all appreciate. Um, it'd be wonderful if we could do that. We don't know that that's actually necessary yet. It kind of depends how this design is going to go. The students at VO, I think, had it the best because they got off the site, they came here, and then when the building was done, they welcomed them, you know, to a new building. At Winchester High School, you know, we lived through that for three years. And importantly, those are older students, too. So we have to be very thoughtful about if there's any measure of swing space on the site, what does that look like? And I don't want to speak for you, Dr. Hackett, but I think this is what you've been trying to get at when you talk about the potential of moving, even if it's just two grade levels. I presume you're talking about that for like a school year or half a year or something to accommodate some activity on the site. It's not that kids are moving one week at Lynch and then one week here, and so that we would look to have some measure of you know stability for them. I, I, yes, now I'm like completely confused just looking at this picture, trying to imagine a scenario where you do a new build and leave the existing Lynch because. Lynch, the existing Lynch would have to come down just for bus loops and traffic and parking. There's, I don't even, I really never even would have imagined that would have been a discussion or an option. And, um, but obviously I wasn't part of those discussions. But I, I, I think in the scenario where even with a ad reno or, or a new build, I, I could see a scenario where you would, we would abandon part of the building, assuming the systems can tie in and, um, that they use temporary systems and heating or whatever to make certain parts of the building work. Abandon part of the building, tear that part of the building mm -hmm. down, take two grade levels, bring them here, or however the swing space would look, maybe you know, potentially, I guess, on site, but not ideally. Um, build or reno that section and then that kind of a phased construction. So the project that I was just involved with in, in Braintree uh, was an ad reno. It's obviously, you know, it's the most complicated. You went through it here at the high school on a tighter site than we had. I feel like we had all kinds of luxury looking back at it and seeing what you were able to do with, with just high school. But um, just that generally would be like a three year phased in project because right. of the way that it would have to kind of roll out, which is very doable. Ideally, I mean, I think VO I, would have, must have been a dream scenario because ideally you would just get kids off the site. You know, right. they'll make it safe. It's not going to be dangerous. They'll deal, you know, we'll deal with all the dust and all the rest of it. But construction is construction and rattling windows and the kinds of stuff that you're just going to experience and depending on how they time it with summer and vacations and how they can do the work um, from, a, from a, just a project planning standpoint they'll have all that stuff in mind but ideally um we you know ideally you would have a clean site with no kids on it that's not a, that's not an option I, I i don't think we have the space to do that so i think the best option whether it's i think you're going to have to have swing space whether it's ad reno whether it's a new construction because that space that that footprint that that building takes up which is significant because it's mostly one story, right? So, right. right. That, I, I mean, you know, I can see also that could become the front of the building, right. potentially, of a new build. So it just seems to me, and that, you know, related really more to the question about central office location, we can, we, we can work from home. Uh, that's, been, that's been suggested <laughs> by a couple of my team members that, that we, you know, that they would be open to that. Um, <laughs> I'm not open to that. But, uh, you know, and we could figure out some kind of temporary location, certainly. But um, 
I just independently don't think that Lynch is a good location for the central office. And can I just, I want to make one other just finer point that the, the master plan didn't really opine on the need for swing space because that really is something that comes up when you actually get into an evaluation of the site and an actual design. So master plans just fly it in higher altitude. Right. But the diagrams that are in the master plan, and I pulled up a couple and out, a couple of them now to look at, you know, they're, they're sort of block diagrams. And what they show, we could do today. We could, I'm looking at a diagram right now. It shows a 91,000 square foot elementary school sitting out there on the site. It is like inches from uh, the building setback. It's inches from the wetland setback. It looks like it's two feet from the 100 year floodplain. The question is, so what does it take to build that? The, that's the question, is to build something in, in this instance here, in this scenario, and there are a couple of different vignettes that you're familiar with. How do you do that with that existing school? What's necessary? Um, what I'm comforted by is that we didn't hear from 10 different architectural firms that all said, you need to get all the kids off of Lynch someplace else or you can't build a building. We, had, we did not hear that. What we did hear is it's gonna be crucial to have some measure of swing space to help facilitate this project. And a few specifically said, if you can't vacate Mystic, which I'm just gonna put out there, we can't. I mean, there is no place to move Rec. There's no place to move Kids Corner. They suggest that if you could find a place to, for central office, this would be really helpful, crucial space. There are 12, we didn't say this earlier, there's 12 classrooms up here on this top level plus very bathrooms and support spaces. Um, when Dr. Hackett talks about two grade levels, that's not because you need 12 classrooms for two grade levels, because as I think it's understood, you'd need specials and various support right. spaces, right? There was this sort of, one thing I thought about over the weekend that I did share last night with the select board is I think we're all, we've heard at times, I, I know Michelle and Karen have heard this, that when we talk about the expense of um, modular classrooms, we've known for some time that the cost to design, procure, and install permanent modular class, when I say permanent, I mean to own them, to have like, like what we have, <laughs> like what we're sitting in, yes, <laughs> exactly, and the two that we have at Ambrose and the two we have at Morocco. Today, that costs $1.5 million per classroom, $1.5 million. Now, you don't pay that much to rent them, but it is extremely expensive when you're renting, and so much so that after three or four years, some districts say, <clears throat> you know, rent to own, let's just keep it. Um, <clears throat> so we've known that number, I think, for a while, that million and a half number. I was trying to think over the weekend, what other ways can we think of the value that we put on classrooms? And the one that really occurs to me the most is what we just did in this building. We just spent over a million dollars to put in an elevator in this building, and we did it to get access to four classrooms with daylight, bathrooms, some support space and that cafeteria gymatorium space that we have down there. So you might, here's how I would propose you think about that. That for a quarter of a million dollars per classroom, for a quarter of a million dollars, you get a classroom and the associated bathroom and support space that, that you would need, which by the way, you don't get with a modular. If you buy a modular, you get a box. You don't get anything else. So if you take that sort of expression of value, and say it's a quarter of a million bucks for a classroom plus all the stuff. What are the 12 classrooms worth up here? It's 12 classrooms. If they're a quarter of a million bucks, that should be, that's $3 million, it would seem. And then ironically, we met with Hill on Monday and we said, based on the work you're doing right now, what is the value of renting modulars? And they said, oh, it's between two to $3 million. So that's reassuring to me because it tells me that there's a, there is legitimately at least two to three million dollars of cost avoidance in the Lynch project if we have the swing space. And to be clear, that is non-reimbursable. Right. Yes. Right. So, you know, and I just pulled up Parkhurst because um, I want to be also clear: it's not a walk in the park <laughs> to bring more students here. I mean, what we have found just with our four sections of pre-K, which is heavily staffed, granted, because you know it is our severest need students, but we would have to have a conversation about the parking, the traffic flow, and those kinds of things um, as part of if we were gonna do any, uh, you know, if we were gonna bring more great sections over here. The, the, the thing that strikes me 
is I come from a school system where the newest school was 55 years old prior to the construction that we were doing. Um, so when people talk about this, the needs of this building, you know, I, the, the, down, the ground level, garden level spaces that have been created for the pre, are beautiful spaces. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the teachers are just, in fact, stopping me and saying, I, we, we love it here. I mean, the spaces are gorgeous, right. the lights, it, so they're wonderful spaces. And up here, this level, I mean, these are, we're in, this is a good structural building with big classrooms that would not take a lot to get those classrooms ready right. to get kids in. But um, I think we're fortunate to have the space because it's, it is so much better than putting kids in a modular unit that's likely disconnected from a building. Um, but Parkhurst would also allow for, if we, had, if we had to add some additional modular units on the site, it could be done so that the bathrooms in the building could be usable. So we're not getting modulars that also have to be have um, toilet facilities in them, which is which is a savings, obviously, compared to if we had to have um, the facilities within the modular units. So I just want to make the point that it's, you know, it would not be without um, a bit of a lift. But um, again, I think for me, uh, from my perspective and just from my experience, I just I would hate to see us having to have compromising conversations about Lynch and where do we put this and this doesn't work because we need a whole separate entrance and parking for the superintendent's office. I would hate to have that be a constraint in the design of a, what's gonna be a beautiful brand new elementary school. And can I offer just a, a thought to this other important point I think that was raised during public comment. Um, this idea of $6 million for an office versus $6 million for kids. Uh, I think we all get that around this table, I do. So importantly, we need to recognize there's a difference between a capital budget and an operating budget. Um, we would, you know, $6 million that's available to, to, to put into investments for our kids, even if it's on a one-time basis, is tremendous. I think we can all agree, that's tremendous. And fortunately, we have, whether it's through ESSER or uh, other opportunities through the CARES Act. We do have some federal money that's coming that, that Dr. Hackett is sort of all on top of and figuring out how, what we can do to apply that for our kids. And um, team. What's that? And my team. And, and your team. Thank right. you. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, no, that's okay. I didn't mean to leave them out. Um, I am terribly concerned, as I think we all are, interested in and concerned about you know, learning loss of our kids and those in our adjacent districts someone said in the in the comments earlier it might have been dr hackett you know not surprisingly that that's that that's the case i mean we're in a global pandemic i've seen it in my own household i was sort of anticipating this um the question is so how do you how do you measure that and what do we do about it and i have confidence that dr hackett dr ellen emma and the team um, are working hard on this and we'll have some important decisions to make about what we need to do to address it but if I try to put this question in the frame of kids, I wanna come back to something that actually Jay Nardone said on the 14th. If you actually just sort of separate for a moment the dollars or the, you know, the impact that it might have on a would-be Lynch school, it's important for us to make the decision now because then we can actually tell the architects that it's either in or it's out. The architects can then focus on designing the best building for Lynch kids with the site that we have and not have to worry about the central office piece. This is about a building that should inspire our students the way the, the original does. And if there are Lynch parents who chuckle when I say that, I have to tell you, one of the greatest strengths of that building today is the incredible amount of daylighting. And when we, when we did the tour with the architects, Dr. Hackett will remember, I saw kids doing the very thing they've been doing for years, uh, a young boy out, traveling from one classroom to the other, walking down the hallway, deliberately stepping where the sunbeam is, stepping over the shadow and the curtain wall, lost in that moment. I mean, generations of kids do this. And what I take from that, I mean, these kids feel they're comfortable in this building, they're happy to be in this building. I want a building that will inspire them. And any, anything that's sort of static, any of, the, any of the other noise that's not essential to a building that can inspire our students and our teachers, just doesn't need to be there. So that's how I kind of put it in the capital frame. I totally appreciate concerns about MCAS scores, MCAS scores and learning loss. 
I would just point out, if central office, if we were in an office building somewhere in Winchester right now, if there was like an old 1948 central administration building and it was tired and it needed a roof and the bricks were falling apart and so forth, and we had an opportunity to move central office to a new renovated office, I don't, we would not be having this discussion. We would not be ha I don't think I would want to be having that discussion. What makes this unique is that we're in a school and it's a school that we've taken out of mothballs a couple of times because it had value to us to do that. And now we're presented and, and to good effect with Ambrose, to good effect with VO, and now we're presented once again with this option for Lynch. To me, what matters is this is an elementary school and it can serve that purpose again for a fantastic Lynch. Mr. Hopcroft. Sure. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you all. That, that's, that's been very helpful. Um, and I've taken um, uh, a number of notes here, um, and so I'll, I'll share my thoughts and observations. Um, you know, I, I, I am a, a you know, Lynch and McCall dad, and so I, I like to think I bring some insights. Um, but, but when I sit at this table, you know, I, I wear a different hat. You know, I, I wear the hat as a committee member, and I represent the entire district. And I think one of the things to really think about is is the, the big picture, the district-wide view. You know, we, we have a lot of assets here um, that are gonna be in play. You know, we have a carriage house, whether we use it or not. We're gonna have to figure out what to do with that. We have this building, the Parkhurst. Um, we have the Lynch renovation and the Morocco renovation coming up. And, and so, um, you know, I think about, you know, buildings are just, they're, they're part of helping our students access education. Uh, you know, Ms. Bergstrom has, I think maybe, uh, where, where I heard that first. Um, and so really thinking about how do all these puzzle pieces, you know, fit together. Um, you know, I think about the, you know, the central office, you know, I think needs to be somewhere um, other than here. Um, this was always a temporary location. Um, it's, you know, we've talked about it not being efficient use of space, having entire classrooms as offices. Um, there's the costs to maintain this building to, to you, know, um, you know, replace the roof or whatnot that, that Mr. Nixon had talked about. Um, you know, and obviously the need for swing space. So the question is, where, where can we move it to? Um, and, and I thought um, Ms. Blackwell's comments were, were really insightful as we move beyond this decision um, and, and take this to the town, that, that really being able to articulate you know, what the different choices were, not just the Carriage House and, and Lynch, but also why not Parkhurst, why not rent? And you've, you've made those compelling cases in the past. And so um, I think uh, laying those out would be good, but um, you know, I, I think where, you know, if we think district wide, there, there's an impact wherever this goes, you know, that there, there will be some additional parking. And I think it's essential that we um, make sure that we provide that parking. In fact, we should provide more parking, I think, in, in whatever project we do than, than the um, central office needs um, to help alleviate some of the issues um, at the schools. Um, you know, I, and I think, I, I think uh, Dr. Hackett um, already mentioned that we can mitigate the the time of, of central, I, I would think that central office might arrive prior to drop off and pick up, but, but we should you know, ex be explicit in the fact that with um, central office as our tenant in, in the building, um, you know, we can control for that and, and have um, the time not compete with the drop off. Um, you know, I look at the carriage house, you know, I, I see an existing you know, building envelope, you know, it, it's you know, separate from a school, but it's nearby the school, which has some benefits um, for using the school. It's a wonderful historical asset in our town that I, I think should be preserved. Um, and, and, um, and, and we have maintenance costs on that building if we don't use it. You know, we, we, need to, we need to fix it up anyway because it's getting you know, water coming into the building and whatnot. Um, and you know, I, I don't feel that tearing it down would ever be um, the right choice, but even that brings costs. So. You know, when you think about the big picture of all the assets, you know, to not go there incurs costs. Um, you know, at Lynch, we've talked about displacing, you know, learning space and just a more complex build in a tight, you know, it's a bigger you know, ship in a smaller bottle. Um, I've, um, I've learned a lot in this process about the constraints on the Lynch site. Um, you, you guys, I think, had a, a, a more informed conversation in the past, but as a lay, a lay person, I would have thought, oh, just build a new building on the field. And then tear down the other building and didn't realize the floodplain issues, the, the abandoned wells, you know, all the, the areas that we 
basically make that not super usable. So I think about um, you know the, the costs. You know both projects are, are similar in terms of costs, um, but but you know the costs of the carriage house. Um, you know you know for not renovating it, we have to start paying for the roof. Um, the costs for the swing space at Parkhurst. Um, you know the, the cost escalations that, that we could see over time for delaying the bidding uh, for two years. Uh, the costs to run two plans on Lynch. You know that that we if we go with the Lynch option, we probably need to be planning for if MSBA says yes or if MSBA says no, I would imagine, um, and, and just that ambiguity. Um, lastly, I'll say, you know, I think having central office inside one of the schools, you know, if, if I just, all of this aside, just, just um, philosophically, I feel like it's, it, it would feel more like a community asset or a community, a place to go um, people might feel more comfortable if it was not physically inside the school. If I had to go into Lincoln or Morocco or something to, to talk about you know, my school or whatnot, somehow it feels more, more uh, district-wide if it's not physically inside the building. And, and lastly, um, you know, I would love it if it was actually closer to me. You know, it, it would just be a convenience. You know, if there was an existing building like down the street from my house that I could just walk to and I drop off my kid and I could pop in to, to you know, figure things out. I, I think that... that have I don't, coffee? Yeah, we could have a cup of coffee. We could, you know, uh, see the garden later or whatever. But, hey, Dr. Hackett, do you have a minute? <laughs> but the, the point being, it, I don't think it's something to, to, you know, push away for the sake of pushing it away. I, I, I think that there are a lot of, you know, just as I try to wear my Town wide hat, you know, notwithstanding being a you know a Lynch parent and, and and knowing some of the constraints very personally on that site, um, you know, I don't I don't think it's a bad thing to have next year school. And so anyway, those those are my observations. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hopcroft. I I think I would agree with you on the last part, Mr. Hopcroft, that I think um, I think if we're going to say that we're not going to consider a central office attached to a school, then we don't consider it on a school site at all. I think that if um, we can't appreciate the benefits of having a central office either as part of the Lynch School, then having it as part of the Ambrose School is not shouldn't be a consideration either. Um, if we see the advantages that a central office could bring to a school site, it does make it more of a community feel there um, you might you know here at Parkhurst as many of us know who have ever tried to come here for the first time we have no idea where our central <laughs> office is this is not any kind of a central location or a place to be and being able to bring families new to town new to the district to, to our brand new elementary school or to our Ambrose site I, I think could both be advantages for a central office that are next to or are adjacent to a school. Um, I think it also brings opportunities for professional development when our, um, our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction is right there in a school building as we are right now. I mean, we have a central office attached to a Winchester public school today. We have preschool in the in the lower in the garden level Thank of you. Parkhurst Thank you. so I don't think that um, I see it attached to a school next to a school as necessarily a disadvantage I can see lots of advantages to that um, there was something that um, you said in terms of timeline I'm looking back at my notes that um, was actually one of my concerns and it was taking Lynch off the table as an option now had we moved forward with the carriage house a year ago, had we secured funding, if we knew that that was a guarantee, I think that um, I would feel more comfortable taking the Lynch option off the table. But my concern is that if we take the Lynch option off the table today as a site for carriage house, or as a site for central office, and carriage house fails, if we fail to secure the town funding for that, then we're in a real pickle. Because then where do we put our central office? Because now we have told MSBA that we're uninterested in having it as part of the Lynch project. The Lynch project has moved forward without it and we don't have carriage house. 
So then what are we left with? And I think that is my concern today is that um, I am not comfortable taking Lynch off the table as a, as a central office location because we don't know what will happen with Carriage House. I was just going to put forth, um, Dr. Hackett, did you have any comment on um, what the process generally is for having a project like central office included in a school, such as Lynch and MSBA's opinion, approach toward including a central office space in a school? I, I, I think would, you had alluded to it. Mr. I would Nixon. love to show off to so, say yes, I do. So, but I think, you had, <laughs> I think you had alluded to it. I think Mr. it's Nixon. so dependent and independent. I think what the MSBA does really, really well is they don't cookie cutter projects. And right. what they say is we don't, we don't think about the cost in the front end. What do you need to fit your program? Where do, what's the vision of your program? That's what we want right. you to talk about. And then let the design follow the function, right? So. Um, I, I think it really truly is completely unpredictable as to what the MSBA would say. Uh, and maybe there are some fantastic designs that come out of the process that make a lot of sense for us to be there. I am, I am only speaking from, I, I like you, Ms. Topcroft, when I, when I went over to Lynch, I automatically assumed, and I, I walked back to the fields, I thought, this is great because <laughs> This is a perfect space for a new building, and this is going to be a piece of cake, even though it's still, you know, hugged by a right. couple of neighborhoods, and then a little crestfallen to find out that that really isn't even an option. Um, so that was my experience, kind of coming into thinking about the project, which is when I started to think about how would you do this, and then um, I just think the uses on the site are incompatible. I do think there are benefits to being near a school, and I think there are benefits to be even being in a school. And if we were talking about a 25 acre site somewhere on a former farm, then I, this would be a different conversation to me. Um, I think the adjacency to a school is good. I, I, I guess the only thing I would say is the carriage house is there. Right. So, and it's, so it's not a matter of building something that's not there. The facility is there, right. the issues around you know the use and traffic flow i, I totally out. understand right. but i i yes i do believe but we don't do a lot of we don't have like you know we start the morning our people people come in it's one-off people that we're going to go to visit a school or we're going to you know or we have a parent meeting or whatever but there's not a lot of traffic in and out during the course of a business day so i don't think that is insurmountable at all and i do think that with the you know the design that tape has put together with the additional parking i also think it becomes an asset for um, the Sanborn house itself. I mean, it is an eyesore, you know, respectfully. I just look at the Sanborn house and I think, oh my God, that's beautiful. And wouldn't I love to have had central office there, which it was one point in time. <laughs> no one's willing to have that conversation with me. But, but, the, we but have been with you. I know, we, we talked about, we talked about the gilded ceiling being my office. Um, but in fairness, it wouldn't look like it does today had you guys stayed there. That's <laughs> That's a detail that I just don't, I don't mess with it. But the carriage houses, I mean, it, it is an eyesore and it is falling down around itself. And then I think to Mr. Hopcroft's point, who, who's the one who's gonna make the decision to tell the town that the school department is tearing it down? And I guess I'm not arguing about any of that, but we still have to secure the funding with it. Agreed. And the thing Agreed. that Agreed. is um, an advantage of the Lintz project is it is, and I hate to say this, only six million dollars more in a 60 million dollar project and in a project where that the community has been pining for for years and years and years new lynch new morocco is what i've heard since i moved to winchester and so adding six million dollars to a project whose funding seems to be something the town is rallying around versus for an independent building I'm concerned that if that funding doesn't go through and we have told MSBA, no, we're not moving towards putting central office at Lynch, then we're left with no option except to continue to go back and back to the town and say, central office is the only option, central office is the only option. 
or if I if I can offer that so for a couple of thoughts so <clears throat> leadership on difficult challenging issues can be hard it is nobody nobody here likes to be we're good at spending money but we're not an appropriating authority right and right. so we have really had to rally in town whether it was most recently McCall expansion both phase one and phase two um, especially phase two given it was an override Winchester High School, 100, let me throw out some numbers. Winchester High School was, I think, around $129 million. VO was around $29 million. Our share was 19. Does, it wasn't that long ago, right? VO feels like almost like it happened yesterday, to me anyway. Um, a project cost of, let's say, $65 million is a big number that we yes, will really have to work hard to explain Yes, we will. Well, if VO was 29, why is this? And believe me, it could be 64, it could be 69, it could be 72. It's a big, big number. So it is not inconsequential to then add to the cost of the ledge project. So that just, it, it, everybody sort of has a limit, right? There is there's a point beyond which people sort of don't want to open their wallets. But, but regardless of what that cost is, it won't diminish our effort. Then there's just the issue of the challenges that that site is going to face with i agree with Ms. bergstrom everybody's been rallying for a new lynch and a new morocco it's going to be bigger i i mean i almost feel like the lynch community almost doesn't know what they're in for it's going to be a big building and it's going to be wonderful but it's going to be a lot bigger and it was a big change you know for the vo community i have to assume going from 14 sections to 21 when we opened and then we expanded the building again in 2015. um added some more yeah. Mr. Hopcroft. So, yeah. Um, so so I, it's a great question that, that Ms. Bergstrom poses about, um, you know, what if the carriage house fails? And, and I'm no expert on, on town finances and things, but I, I do know that that um, I myself and everyone else in the town values their money, and we want to be, you know, as efficient as we can with it. And so I was just pondering that question, and I'm like, if it fails, um, it means that we automatically incur that extra 2 to $3 million in swing space because we don't have the swing space. We start incurring whatever the cost is to shore up that building, um, the carriage house. Um, I don't know what a new roof costs, half a million, I don't, I don't know. Um, plus, you know, the cost of the $6 million of putting, you know, if, if we're going to include it into the Lynch. And so now all of a sudden we're spending on the neighborhood of $9 million um, and disrupting the Lynch project and perhaps delaying it and things. And and so it it strikes me that, that it, it would be better to make a decision and and do our best to make the case for why we think this is the right place and and it's more cost effective than incurring you know, the 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 expenses that, that um, and and you, you know better than I do, um, Mr. Nixon on on what those costs are. But um, but just as I'm a, a lay person trying to add this up, it. Yeah. it Maybe I have that wrong. No, well, the only thing I would add to your list is nobody's going to kick central office out of Parkhurst. So we, we can keep trying to go back to the well and make the case as many times as we feel we need to for the carriage house. And if ultimately the community doesn't support it, then central office stays here. But here is a building with, as I said earlier, $15 million in renewal and replacement cost needs. So it's going to require replacing portions of the heating plant. There was a, there's a six-figure electrical request that came from DPW for this building that we deliberately took offline with capital this year. And we said, we're not gonna ask for any more money for Parkhurst, especially with the elevator, which had gone over budget. We're not gonna ask for any more funding for Parkhurst until we kind of figure out what the plan is. If the plan, whether the school committee wants it to be the plan or it's just the plan that we're dealt. If the leadership team stays in this building, we're going to continue to incur costs, and and it'll be capital conversations at this table that will be in addition to things like fixing the McCall facade and the site work at Lincoln and uh, replacing the boilers at Morocco. We need to replace the roof at the Parker School because we have a central office team that's here. I mean, we I don't want I don't want to use water buckets here. We actually did that at Lynch when central office was there for a few years. Um, that's just what we will have to do. And, and, I, and so then one just can look at that over the long term and say, so what makes more financial sense? And I guess I'm not suggesting taking, um, prioritizing Lynch over Carriage House, but just simply moving forward with both, with telling the MSVA that we're going to move forward at, that we're interested in moving forward with design at Lynch, 
and continuing to secure the funding for carriage house so that we don't eliminate an option for ourselves. So um, my only reaction to that would be um, we have twice before voted to prioritize the carriage house as the permanent home for central office. We did it with the master plan in 17. We did it again a couple of years later when we went to town meeting for you know funding for this exercise. And we committed at the time that if we should be lucky enough to partner with the MSBA, whether it was going to be Lynch or Morocco, we would absolutely still look at that. The purpose of this exercise that we just did with TAP A was to figure out, can it really work like we thought it would in the master plan, but how would it really work? And to figure that out, you have to know what your space needs are. So by the way, the one, the one investment we've made that's not wasted in any respect is the space program. So I hope we've made that clear from day one. So we, we have a document. What, whatever we need in the carriage house, we will literally hand off to the Lynch architect if that's the direction that the committee chooses to go. But the purpose of the exercise was to figure out what kind of space do we need? Does it work? If so, what does it cost? And then how does that compare, in this instance, to Lynch? I'd be the first one at the table. If we found out that the carriage house was going to cost twice as much at Lynch, I would be saying we need to have a conversation about surplusing the building. But that's not what we learned. Um, we learned that they are, on a construction cost basis, virtually identical. On a project cost basis, they're certainly similar. It's a little bit of the devil you know versus the devil you don't. There, there's, there's more certainly risk associated with Lynch for those project costs to go higher, but we don't have anything concrete yet to tell us that. For me, the tipping point is, in addition to the opportunity to save a historical asset, to Mr. Hopcroft's point, it's a school building. It, needs, it will need some sort of maintenance. Um, it will need a new roof. We're sitting on between ninety dollars and $95,000 in hazardous material abatement costs alone up there at the carriage house, and that, that's a legacy cost. If we were to decide 10 years from now to tear down the carriage house, you'd still have to fully abate the building. You can't just knock it down because it's loaded with hazardous material. So that's like a liability and the clock runs. So it's estimated that the cost today to cut and cap utilities, to fully abate the building, to demolish the building and to the restore the site could be up to $300,000. So the point there is just whether it's, well, there is no like zero cost, op, right? There's not like a zero cost, right. do nothing option. So whether it's keeping central office here and not building any new space, then we're gonna continue to incur capital cost in keeping central office here. But even if we don't spend a nickel on the carriage house tomorrow, we have a cost liability there that continues to grow even if that building should go away. And I would actually, let me just say, I, I hope that 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 never happens only because I think for years now the school committee has said the reason that we did not, this came up in 2011, um, the reason the school committee did not want to surplus the carriage house was that it saw the potential for an administrative use. But, but the school committee didn't really pursue that because that would take a study and it would take funding and what we were most focused on at the time was the Vincent Owen School. And so with the swing space now completed here and then vacated when those kids were going to move to VO, this building was the low-hanging fruit. So it kind of took the pressure off of the school committee and the district at the time. So we just kind of said, well, we'll, we'll come back to that, but we don't want to surplus that building. Because if we surplus a building, it's gone for good. But in all of these years, there's been no interest in the carriage house for anything other than some sort of administrative use. So it's not like we, we've never seen it like as an instructional space, for instance. So where this goes is if the school committee decides it's not the carriage house, then we really do need to have a conversation about surplusing the building. And, and once we do that, you know, the, then the destiny of that building really falls into the hands of the select board. But it's permanent. It's not ours anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Hill, I think I would ask either Dr. Hackett or the chair to, to to hit this more clearly if I don't. Hill, Hill spoke to this issue of decision making last night. It is essential that we vote this tonight. We have to tell, we've already said to the MSBA that as of right now, central office is not in the building. If, that is, if we wish it to go into the new Lynch, we have to tell them that, and then that is our decision. The MSBA is aware that we've done the study. They know that we're slated to vote by October 1st, and we need to tell them what our decision is. 
and that was made just very clear last night. If this committee should opt to go to the carriage house, then we have to pledge to work with the select board, finance committee, and others to find a pathway for funding. Mr. Brady. I appreciate all the points that everyone has made thus far. I, I think this is certainly a complicated issue, and so I appreciate everything that everyone has said and also the feedback that we've heard from the community as well. Um, I think it's been very insightful. I don't think it's an easy decision to make. I, I think for me, my main concern is that we'll end up making a decision that costs a lot more in the long run and 15, 20 years from now, people will be sitting here and there may be some of the same people, maybe different people, and they'll really be questioning why we kicked the can, the proverbial can, down the road. And I just don't want us to be in that position. My concern is if, if we make a, a short-sighted decision in the long term, it is going to cost us a lot more money, and it's going to cost the district and the town a lot more money. And just historically, when I, I look at not just Winchester, but any number of towns, um, that tends to be the response, that, that people are hesitant to spend some money in the short term, and then in the long term it ends up costing a lot more, and they don't have that foresight. And I think it's hard to have that foresight, um, and it, it's a tough decision to make because people don't always understand it, people don't always agree with you, but for me that's what's really important. I, I think people are surprised when we're rebuilding all of our elementary schools almost within a 20-year span. And again, not to judge anyone's decision in the past, but there's a reason that they all ended up needing to be rebuilt in a 20-year in a span, right? There's a reason for that. Things get pushed on and pushed on and pushed on. And so I, I would encourage us not to be doing that, um, if possible, not to push these things on and not to leave us in a situation where in the future we're gonna have to spend even more money uh, on something that we could try and make the decision now and again, not an easy decision, but that's what I'm really thinking about in the long term because ultimately it is going to come away from the town. It is going to come away from our students if we're spending much more money in the future than we have the opportunity to potentially spend now. I think we see there's so many things in our town that people would like to see. There are uh, projects, ideas, amenities, resources that people would like. and you know, I, I always think about that when we're spending the tax dollars. So it, it may seem that we're spending more than we would like now. It, it, uh, of course, when I hear $6 million for a central office building, of course that sounds like a large number. Oh my gosh, you know what, why can't it be less? But um, and no, no offense taken, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, I wouldn't want to be, you know, 20, 20 years from now, you know, hearing that, oh, okay, this is going to now cost us $40 million or, or $50 million. And I, I just, that's my concern that we're going to find ourselves in some kind of situation because we kind of push this decision off that's going to cost us a significant amount more money. Um, and I know I'm talking kind of abstractly, but it, it's just a concern and, and I've had it as we've gone through this process um, and just, you know, being a former member of the finance committee, it's something that I thought a lot about then too when I was on the finance committee. And as I talk to people around town about, you know, why do we have to have all these overrides? Why, why do these things occur as they're occurring? And I try to explain to people, well, for a long time, there, there weren't a lot of things built. There, you know, there, there was this long period where to be quite frank, when you compare us to other towns, Winchester's tax rate was pretty low. It, it's gone up significantly when you compare it, but I, I think that's people need to recognize that. So for a long time, that's taken place. But eventually, we have these obligations. You know, we have to educate our students. We have to provide buildings that will work for them. Um, and and so we're coming up against all these costs at once. I don't want to be contributing to that in the future again. I, I don't want us to be contributing to another scenario where we have a lot of cost and they've all come up at once and it's because we push them off. So I, I just wanted everyone to think about that because um, I've just been thinking about it a lot. 
as a superintendent who was coming from a school system that did just exactly, and I timed it perfectly because I went in when everything was falling apart. Not only do you spend more money to create whatever it is you're going to create this new, but you are then in emergency spending mode full, nonstop, like uh, you know, having to abate a floor in a cafeteria because it's asbestos tile and they're popping up and you can't keep going over it with wax. You know, those decisions that you don't budget for that then get into your budget and they just start sucking up all the resources that should be going to kids. So, uh, and I think this town, from my perspective, uh, to all of you, I mean, I think this town has done a great job really thinking forward about school buildings and through the capital process and what you've done with VO and um, uh, what you've done with the high school and now Lynch, I think uh, is there's a lot of foresight here and a lot of planning that I think, I don't think other towns really enjoy the benefit from so um, I just can tell you that it is I was just in a school system where the resources were not we couldn't even think about planning for the future because we were just trying to get through the present yeah, I, I might um, add if I could I appreciate uh, mr. Brady's um, uh, financial view on this because it, it you know we, we want to be good stewards of the town's money um, uh, absolutely um, there's also you know it, the investments we make into education in our town are significant, and we see it in in the number you know in a in a state where the number of kids graduating matriculating through K twelve is declining. We're in one of the towns where it's increasing. Well, that, there's a reason for that. It's because we're we're really you know being thoughtful and thinking about you know, what is best for our kids, and so you know yeah that that means that more people come here. Now we have to build bigger schools. So we have you know more more investments we have to make, but it also means that property values go up, and and you know there's a lot of very beneficial um, you know th there's a bigger context here, um, and 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 um, you know Mr. Brady's comments you know, just made me think about the interrelationship between you know not only do we want to be a good steward with the money, but what we're doing with the money matters, and and being really thoughtful I think and um, and, and really putting the students first in their in their you know learning experiences and the, you know the buildings are really that vehicle you know to access the education and um anyway I just it occurred to me when you had said that oh, sorry done that twice now can I just I, I, I had another thought I wanted to offer Mr. Brady just reminded me of something um there are when you when you talk about your observations around town um, and the fact that it's not just schools, there are other sort of departments where we haven't kind of kept up with investments and in capital projects that you're well aware of being at the FinCon table. Um, this cycle alone, the department heads who made requests of capital, if you take the total cumulative value of just their number one request was $1.8 million of everybody's number one. And everybody came with between six and 12 requests. So that's dump trucks, that's fire engines, that's fixing the facade of McCall, it's site work at Lincoln. As appreciative as we are for the operating capital override, it really did make a huge difference on the capital front, although we got rid of the, of the, um, the retiring debt piece. Um, we, we still were able to kind of lock in um, a regular stream, you know, for capital, and that was huge still doesn't fully meet the needs. And I think we all knew that. And we also knew when we talked about the operating override, how helpful it was, but it wasn't gonna carry us forever. Um, I just wanna make the observation that I think last night, at, as we were wrapping up with the select board, the chair made the comment, there's an acknowledgement that we'll have to think hard and creatively about how to pay for this. One of the options isn't that it stands alone it may well be that it's a, a conversation about bundling, just like we did in the spring with ballot question one, which was both $3.6 million to sustain the life of Morocco and also invest in the last and, and most crucial flood mitigation project, which is sort of the keystone of a 17 year project. We have needs at DPW, we have needs at public safety in the capital realm of projects that you know, may struggle to make the cut with capital, just given other needs. Like for instance, if the fire engine's breaking down, how do you say no to the fire chief? You can't, but there are other really important needs. And so I think that was the, that was the intimation I picked up on last night, is that if we choose to go to the carriage house, we say, if we say we wanna reaffirm the carriage house is where we want central office to go, 
part of that discussion around securing funding includes talking about, is it just the carriage house? Is there some other ask that's important to the quality of life in Winchester? And then it may actually be two or three things that are being presented in a ballot question. But those are conversations we have to have um, with the select board and FinCom. Thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I guess I would just comment that as school committee and looking back over the years of school committee, we are, um, we do have to plan ahead for our buildings and how we will use our buildings and our school committees of the past have held on to assets such as the carriage house. Um, in case they needed to be used at some point, or Parkhurst, or even with our Mystic School and its usage um, right now as rental space. Um, so I think that's a good thing that um, we have thought about those things over the years and that we continue to think about that now. Um, and I do recognize many of the concerns that have been brought up at the table this evening and also over all the time that we have been discussing these options and then over the years. Um, so with that, um, do we have any further comment on, s on this or would we like to move ahead to making a decision on what we would like to do. I'm happy and to make a motion. That would be welcome. We have a number of suggested language here. <laughs> so I move to uh, I would move to affirm the 10-year facilities master plan recommendation and designate a restored and renovated Sanborn carriage house of approximately 8,100 gross square feet as presented as the future home to the Winchester Public Schools Central Administrative Offices and further to work with the Select Board, Town Management, Capital Planning Committee, and Town Meeting to identify and secure funding sources for the work. We'll second that. And thank you very much. Um, and I guess all in favor? Aye. 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 I abstain. Uh, not not as opposed to carriage house, but as opposed in taking the lynch option off the table before we've secured funding for carriage house. Okay. Um, so the vote is a four, zero, and one abstinence. Um, as stated. And so, so we will we will communicate this to Hill. Um, and uh, we've already voted to put a placeholder on the fall warrant. Um, Dr. Hackett's been involved with town management, sort of noodling in the language a little bit. It's substantially similar to what the school committee saw. Um, and I, you know, so the next focus for us will just be sort of articulating that message for fall town meeting. Um, and to clarify, we're not asking for six million dollars at fall town meeting. We're asking for fifty-seven thousand bucks. So, yeah. <laughs> just wanted to be clear about that too. Um, not a six million vote on the table tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, it just up on screen. We will move on to our next action item. Oh, the academy. The, uh, so I guess, so our next action item was consideration of approval of the fall town meeting warrant. Um, and I guess at our last meeting, school committee had voted unanimously to approve a placeholder on the fall town meeting warrant to request funding of $57,000 toward the next step in, proce in the process of examining the carriage house, which is design and development. Um, and as we already have this placeholder set up, we can decide now if we would like to 
proceed with this as is. So should and we share that the, the only change that was so. proposed by town council was um, instead of just saying free cash, which is what we had proposed right. as a placeholder, was to say free cash or other available funds, uh, which is standard practice um, for something like this. So that seemed pretty innocuous. So we did that. We Would they like us to revote it then with that language? No, this falls no, edited? this falls into the usual category of word smithing. Okay. So they they ran it through the superintendent. I believe he said it was okay, right? Yeah, so we're good. Okay. We'll take it any way they want to give it to us. Well, and, and <laughs> to be clear, I, I also think it's helpful because since the select board wanted to have the conversation last night, I mean, free cash certainly is a source, but right. there are other opportunities out there. So this is a way to be a little more sort of open-minded about it. The motion language itself will, of course, have to articulate more clearly where the funding source comes from. So right, right now, this is just the articles before that goes to print for the warrant. So would you think that this would really just be a vote to reaffirm the warrant article as it, as adjusted by? It, well, as council? it says, action recommended none or action to withdraw. I don't think we need to take any action. Um, I mean, typically the school committee would allow the superintendent to. I mean, when we submit drafts for the warrant, it's always subject to review of legal counsel. So now that they've done that, and it's okay with you, I and we've sort of verbally described it. It's fine by me. I do have a procedural question, though. Yeah. It's we voted to put a placeholder. Sorry, mm -hmm. we voted to put a placeholder. Now, do you know we not have to vote to actually put it on? No, no, do you, we're do done. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're done. Okay. We had submitted the. We had submitted just language, a placeholder, but we yeah. had submitted the language. Yeah, the right. language was submitted. In other words, yes. it was made clear to management that right. if right. the school committee should say we don't want to go to the carriage house, then we'll right. withdraw it. Right. But if we voted that we wanted then to go to the carriage okay. house, we'll just leave it there. Just making sure that we're yes. not going to. Yes, and we're leaving <laughs> it there with just a couple of minor tweaks from from council. So, do we need anything such as consensus around? We're just leaving it as is, or we just have no action that is necessary at this point on this? We, need we don't okay. need to take any formal action. I okay. presume we have consensus that it's okay that legal counsel wants to make a little language change in terms of funding source, but I think we're good. It's actually the board, so the, the, the select board makes the final vote on the warrant itself. That's their authority. So the assistant town manager will communicate to the board the changes that council has recommended. All right, thank you very much. And now we will move on to the consideration of approval of the Lotus Academy. <laughs> and so we had received an application from Ms. Lian Yu requesting school committee approval for the Lotus Academy, which is a Chinese immersion school. Um, and under Massachusetts general law, chapter 76, um, number one, a new private school must obtain the approval of the school committee in the town where the school is located. And the school committee's approval simply means that Massachusetts students who attend the private school can do so without violating um, compulsory attendance law. Um, this is not an evaluation of the program quality, nor is it an endorsement of the program itself. So we have Dr. Ellen Emma and Dr. Hackett for comments. So I would just add this, uh, you have uh, in your packet, which was previously distributed, the Academy uh, application that was submitted. Mm -hmm. um, we have reviewed it administratively. Uh, Dr. Ellen Al Emma has reviewed it as well. Um, and we find it to meet all the requirements that we would be for what would be your standard for approval. As you know, um, is, and it's already been stated, the school committee has to approve it to operate as a school within the community. Um, but in terms of ongoing review, uh, that is left really with administration. So we, uh, we have a, would have a cycle to visit and just to make sure that it, the school is operating kind of consistent with the application process. So, um, and Dr. Allen and I can speak more to it, but we, we would recommend approval as, as presented. And I should also mention that I believe we have a representative from the Lotus Academy. Um, if you would like to join us at the table in case there are any questions for you. Good evening. Yes. Hello. Or if, if, you'd you like could, to, yeah, if you'd like to. With the microphone, yes. please. Yes, <laughs> there's a microphone. Thank you. Thank you.
welcome. Hi, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Sun Ling Liu, and uh, this is uh, Miss Yu. She will be our principal uh, in the New Lotus uh, Academy. All right, so um, if you have any questions, okay. Yeah, thank you. I have one. The site of the school is familiar to us because we had another present, another request mm -hmm. to the school committee. I'm assuming that even though it's St. Mary's, this is different separate space from the other applicant that came before the school committee because they also spoke about interest for expansion. We want to be sure we're not we're not sending two programs to the same space. <laughs> is that right? That's correct. And um, I spoke with the other school, the Wilder School, just last week and they still have two students possibly three enrolled so she doesn't anticipate okay bigger expansion anytime soon got it and how many students do you have students right. enrolled already or how many students do you expect right now we haven't really started yet okay but uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, you know, advertise and then uh, accepting students. Hopefully, uh, after the approval, we will try to start the school as soon as possible, most probably maybe in uh, January. Yeah. Okay, so you have a little bit of time yet. And it's for K through sixth grades? K through six. K through six, you said? And each individual classrooms or? Are they each like separate classrooms for? How many classroom spaces right. do you have? Uh, right now, just like another one, we only have one. One. Yeah, we learned one. One. So we okay. We don't know how many students. Okay. Yes, Mr. Hopcroft. Um, I, I'm, I'm generally very supportive of this. I, I, I'm um, a little bit familiar with with the program that you have already and and uh, but I was curious when I was looking over the budget um, which looks like it anticipates maybe 10 students um, it was a very modest budget which which led me mm -hmm. to um, wonder how much is the plan or I guess I'm, I'm inferring um, and, and maybe you can tell me if this sounds right um, are, are you, you you have 120,000 I think of, of payroll in here so, so you're not able to hire a lot of people uh, to run the school um, are you leveraging the existing program and just having those folks take on additional time? Or I'm just kind of curious how, yeah. Uh, am I being uh, clear? You know, it seems to run a whole school on $120,000 of payroll seems difficult unless you already had people working for the existing program and maybe you're just having them each take on 10% more or, or hire one person and do some things. I was just curious. Oh, yeah. Okay. For the Chinese program, that will be easier because we have already have the teacher, and the who uh, teach in the afternoon. So in the morning, they can teach the class. So it's existing teachers yeah, that just take yeah. on a little bit more. That's, yeah. That's, that's what I sort of infer in here. Okay. Yes. So I do have a question. Yes. Can you tell us what is a gifted student? What do you mean by give the students? So your proposal says that students may be placed in a lower grade level than where they are currently, and you go on to say that gifted students may be placed at a higher grade level. What is a gifted student? How do you determine, how do you judge what is a gifted student? <laughs> I think um, what Ms. Yu is trying to say is, like for example, I, uh, we have this uh, Singapore map. Okay. We propose to teach Singapore map. Singapore map uh, is a map, uh, the, the level, okay, so we have uh, from K until 12. And then, uh, so we will have students that might have uh, very good in math. So if they are very good in math, okay, if we think that uh, this student, even though he or she might be in first grade, but she can reach the he or she can reach the second grade level. We'll move the them to the second grade level. So this is what we meant by gifted or talented uh, students, right, in math or in certain uh, other field. Like for example, uh, some of the students might be very good in uh, language, like in Chinese. So maybe this kid 
might be in a in the first grade, but he or she can speak very fluent in Chinese already. So we, he or she might not be in the first grade level Chinese language. Instead, it will be move up to uh, you know the level that are supposed to be. That's what we mean by the gifted and talented in certain field. So I appreciate that, and and the reason I ask it is, um, as the assistant superintendent is well aware, we've had some lengthy conversations at this table around that kind of label. What is a gifted student? We've we've had in some years calls for gifted and talented programs, and it's led to a lot of soul searching. It's driven a lot of interesting and insightful conversation about the importance of differentiated instruction. So, I'm interested in understanding. What does that physically mean for a child? Is it about, are you saying that the child is sort of still in that environment with peers, but maybe is given more challenging work? Or is this child sort of put physically in a different place with, with different kids? And so they're sort of physically being separated, which are some of the issues that we've talked about in the mm -hmm. past. And I would invite Jen, if, if there's anything else to add to that that makes this more relevant or understandable, jump in. But I think you understand where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense, what I'm asking? Yeah, I think that we removed uh, the student to the higher level, physically, because uh, in the different class. If, uh, if he's belonged to the second grade, and then he will go to the second grade. This is like in, in our Chinese school, mm -hmm. and uh, we have like a case student. They were goes to first grade or seven, uh, the second grade. For Chinese. And so how does one, and I'm, I wish I had the familiarity Mr. Hopcroft does, but if, there, if a student demonstrates strong performance um, in one subject, mm -hmm. but not necessarily in others, how are, how are you, how, how do you react to that or accommodate that? I mean, if, if students are physically being sort of separated because of performance, and, and I, I understand there's a difference between performance and ability, and I don't want to belabor this too much, but I just, this is something I really wanted to be sure we were talking about because this really strikes at some philosophical conversations that we had around this table. And I want to be sure we understand sort of what the approach is and that that's, that that's something we feel is sort of you know, appropriate. Yeah. Um, so would, would students sort of move physically from one environment to another based on sort of their level in one area of study? Is that sort of what I'm hearing? Uh, I think so, yeah. Just to clarify, you're starting with one classroom right. space, right? Yeah. So yes. physically moving in the beginning is not going to be an option because you only have one classroom space. Yes. So at some point, you, you would... You join different the group. Right. Right, yeah. Right, within, within the same space. Yeah, in the same room. And, and then the if you, different you, you, okay. group. All right. And right. if your enrollment grows, then you might need to add another classroom, yes. which might give you some more option. Mm -hmm. It yeah. sounds a lot like flexible grouping to me or even really kind of standards based uh, that if students have mastered a certain standard that they are able to go on to and um, to more challenging standards there might be at a grade level that's higher than what they're in um, gifted and talented has a very specific definition mm -hmm. for those of us in public education mm -hmm. which it which does not sound like it's being applied in this situation and i appreciate the question because it does it can get contentious but I don't mm -hmm. know that you are applying the same definition in the same way it sounds very much like a flexible grouping kind of standards based um, and gifted is a gifted students is sort of a loaded expression right. in education so that that's why I'm asking it there's so much information here there's there's a lot of information there's it's very well thought out but it also sounds like this is in its infancy so it's just sort of one room so in some respects, maybe some of this language contemplates a program that has grown and is serving more students than really what you're starting out at, I suppose, is what I'm hearing. And I think that we, because we're in the environment of acronyms and terms, and we have a whole world that is not necessarily well known to everybody else, that yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just means something different to us as public education because there's statute around it and um, conversations around it. So. I'm not hearing you say gift and talented. I'm hearing you say something very different that you take the child where they are 
and if they can perform or move to a higher level, that's what you're going to provide them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I believe the same was true of the Wilder School that we approved right. previously. Right. That they're, right. That's their approach as well. Right. Great. Thank you for clarifying. It strikes me there's an opportunity here um, as we have sort of there's the view of, of the education community um, around this to, to help educate and shape um, as, as the school is developed to, to share the philosophy and, and the background on that. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Great. Right. Good point. Any further comments? Otherwise, I would welcome a motion um, on approving the Lotus Academy. Move to approve the Lotus Academy. Second. As recommended. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Hi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry you had to wait so long. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. for your patience. Have a good evening. Have a good good luck. Yes. Best wishes. Our decision is much easier than the one you had before. It, it, it must look ridiculous. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have a Thank good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, next on our agenda is consideration of approval of a donation of a dual digital scoring table by the Winchester Sports Foundation. And okay, um, this is a donation from the Winchester Sports Foundation for a dual digital scoring table. Uh, it totals $12,944, and you have the information um, with a letter from the Winchester School or Winchester Sports Foundation and the quote in your packets. Do we have any questions or comments on this? Otherwise, I would accept a motion. I move to accept the gift of the dual digital scoring table from the Winchester Sports Foundation as presented. Second. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 And next we have consideration of approval of minutes. Um, I will just say we are working diligently to catch up the minutes from our summer meetings as we now, and we now have new staff in our central office. So I'd like to just make a big welcome to Ms. Erin Allen, who is our new executive assistant to Dr. Hackett. Um, so during this transition, the minutes are taking some extra time. So we will hold on these for the moment and come back to them. And chair report, I have nothing further to add this evening. Superintendent's report. I dare not add anything um, to the Meaning, I would say that um, we are looking forward to working with you with, with norms uh, tomorrow and goal setting. I'm looking forward to that work. I think it, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I think uh, to pull a lot of stuff out of what we've already done. Um, and you know, I would be talking to you tomorrow about maybe some kind of stra strategic framework structures that we can have the conversation in and around. So. Um, and I think tomorrow is a very short time away, actually, right now. So it does seem very. Well, can I just clarify something, Dr. Hackett, real quickly from your initial communication comments? I believe you use the word anomaly, and not to refer to students individually, but to test scores. So I made a note that, and I had decided to not come back to that. But <laughs> I will take the I just, opportunity <laughs> to clarify that, of course, as a parent, I just wanted to clarify father, that neither this committee yeah. nor you see children as anomalies. I, I thank you. That we view them as individuals, yes. and we do exactly what you just said. We take them from where they are to where they need to be. Correct. And I maybe needed to be more clear about an, a, a test anomaly. Right. Uh, as opposed Situational. To, as opposed to children yes. being anomalies. I have anomalies in my house, but that is not, that's, <laughs> but that's them. <laughs> that's just who they are. Just so. going to say the same thing. <laughs> I'm the only anomaly in my house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have many of my own. So thank you for the opportunity to clarify that. I was going to stay away from it, but I think that's good. So. Uh, thank you. And next we have future agenda items. Um, we have many here. <laughs> And I will just ask if anybody has any other future agenda items. I can put some dates on these for you if you'd like. So the first meeting in October, which I think is the 16th. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, that is a is Tuesday, but that's our, that's our community kickoff. 
day. I'm sorry, it, that's it November. October Forgive me. 12th. Forgive me. Never mind. Yeah. 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 Never mind. Tuesday 12th. 12th. Okay. Yeah. 12th. Thank you. So Tuesday the 12th, we will um, do the enrollment update, and then we're going to bring the finance update and personnel update on the at the following meeting, which is the 26th. 26th. Yes. Because um, those do go hand in hand. Um, as you know, um, Mr. Rowe has been uh, working with me and JD, and I, I feel good about um, we've they've done a great job of really just kind of try to build from the past history of budgeting, bringing things forward, really looking at positions, and um, just know that 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 additional time would will be helpful so that we can really set a baseline for FY22 moving forward, and in late October. But we will have the enrollment report report for you. Uh, at the first meeting in October. Can I suggest that we're probably going to need building projects on here as well? If we're moving forward with Carriage House and we're beginning to have the community meeting with Lynch, we're going to need to be having more conversations around the table here. Okay. Uh, next meeting dates are coming up at, I think we've already covered some of them, October 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, October 26th at 6 p.m. and then November 9th at 6 p.m. So I will, um, I'm 50-50 on the 12th. I may be participating remotely, but we'll, I if I do, it's gonna be like low impact. Like I literally <laughs> may just be watching over WinCam and somebody has a speaker on or something. I, I don't wanna be a bother on uh, the 12th. We can make it work. Yes. Um, do we need a placeholder meeting before town meeting? What's that? Do we need a placeholder meeting before town meeting? Well, I think we have lots of time to figure that out. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's our, our typical practice is we like pull a meeting. Certainly, we always want to have a room at the high school before a town right. meeting when we meet. But mm -hmm. since we just, as we know, a town meeting is going to be remote, yep. we got to figure out how to deal with that. Right. That's why I was thinking we might want to just put a note to ourselves. That yeah. We may even meet in person, even if town meetings yeah. remote. Prior to it, yeah, we could bring everyone together and do town meeting remotely here together as a group. Make Are kind of a night out of it. Yeah. Some food, beverages. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm new. I'm just so yeah, I, I was gonna say I, I might camaraderie find that it, I would actually want to be able to be home for town meeting just because Base. oh come on Again, the camaraderie I, I like to have my individual <laughs> space and yeah, I, would want us to, I would want us to either have our prior meeting um over zoom or to make sure we budget enough time that people could transition back home yes. if they would like to i also was forgetting that there was multiple nights last year so um i yeah that's probably a home environment is probably more comfortable Okay. <laughs> but All no right. Girl Scout cookies and coffee when we're at home. Okay. Just saying. Um, so with that, we have next on executive, an executive session on the schedule. And I will just read our verbiage. The committee will adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing strategy related to collective bargaining, since to do so in open session would be detrimental to bargaining. And the committee will reconvene in open session only for the purposes of adjournment. So, so moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Aye. 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 Uh, the vote was unanimous. So we will adjourn at, or I'm sorry, we will move to executive session at 837. Yes. And thank you very much to, to Wincam for as we said before, all your support. <laughs>